Mark Calloway signed with the WWF in October of 1990. Before making his way to New York, Mark had worked under multiple names and gimmicks, from Texas Red in World Class Championship Wrestling, The Master of Pain and The Punisher in the USWA, Mean Mark in WCW, Punisher Dice Morgan in New Japan very briefly, and right before his WWF debut, he worked as Mark Callis once again in WCW. When Mark had his first meeting with Vince McMahon, he was initially told that there wasn't a spot available for him. Eventually, Vince called him back around the time of Survivor Series 1990. In the run-up to this pay-per-view, a giant egg was revealed on TV that would hatch at the Survivor Series show, and Mark Calloway revealed on Steve Austin's Broken Skull Sessions that he thought he was being brought into the company to be the surprise that hatched out of this very egg. So, The Undertaker at one point thought he was going to be the gobbledygooker. Mark said that he was worried so much about being the Eggman that his stomach began to hurt. Though thankfully, Vince called him back and told him he would be The Undertaker, and he was invited to Stamford where he was shown sketches of what The Undertaker character might look like. Mark said that it took him a while to put all The Undertaker stuff together, but as we know, it all worked out in the end. Bruce Pritchard, the man who would manage The Undertaker in his very early matches, has taken credit for coming up with The Undertaker gimmick. Pritchard said, I was a big fan of his when he broke in in Dallas because he wrestled and he moved and he walked the ropes like the original spoiler, Don Jardine. I was just a big fan of his and I watched him from the time he broke in in Dallas all the way to WCW. Paul Heyman called me when he was available and said, Hey, this guy is looking to get out and I said I'd love to have him. The original idea was mine, to basically have the black to my white. So when he came in, the original idea was that he would come in under the name Kane, as in Kane and Abel. So he was Kane the Undertaker. We then dropped the Kane name after about two or three weeks and he just became the Undertaker. One month after signing with the WWF, Mark had his first matches in the company on the 19th and 20th of November. Both of these dates were tapings for WWF Superstars and WWF Wrestling Challenge, respectively. In his very first WWF match, Mark defeated Mario Mancini in a squash match on Superstars, and the next day he defeated Rick Sampson. Now, these were of course tapings and therefore they were aired at a later date, so his famous Survivor Series debut aired on TV before these tapings. As stated earlier in Bruce Pritchard's quote, Mark was first known as Kane the Undertaker during his initial matches in the WWF, with the name Kane eventually being used for Undertaker's storyline brother. Early footage from his first Superstars and Wrestling Challenge matches shows him being announced as Kane the Undertaker. Kane the Undertaker! The name was of course dropped. It's been incorrectly reported over the years that Undertaker was introduced at Survivor Series 1990 as Kane the Undertaker during the live broadcast. People seem to think that this was the case and the WWF edited the name on home releases, but this just isn't the case. Here is the live version recorded from VHS and he is indeed announced as the Undertaker. I give you the Undertaker! <laughs> the Undertaker! So Ted DiBiase had a surprise for us at the 1990 Survivor Series. His million dollar team, featuring Greg Valentine, the Hunky Tonk Man and DiBiase himself, were set to take on the Dream Team featuring Bret Hart, Jim Nedhart, Dusty Rhodes and Coco Beware. Before the match began, DiBiase announced that the fourth member of his Survivor Series team would be The Undertaker, and fans at home got their first look at this new character as he made his way down to the ring. He looked huge when he got in the ring, and he went on to eliminate Coco Beware with a tombstone pile driver within the first minute of the match. Undertaker also eliminated Dusty Rhodes before getting counted out himself. But what did come across quite well during this match was that The Undertaker seemed to be unstoppable. He couldn't be hurt and he no-sold everything in an attempt to look as strong and indestructible as possible. 
DiBiase's team won their Survivor Series match here, and so The Undertaker's debut was a success. Undertaker would finish 1990 with wins over enhancement guys before making his way to the 1991 Royal Rumble. In the Royal Rumble match he had a good showing, he came off as indestructible, but the Royal Rumble match was won here by Hulk Hogan. On TV, The Undertaker would continue destroying job guys while working against more notable stars on house shows. Undertaker had matches with The Big Boss Man, Jimmy Snuka and a string of matches with Tugboat throughout January and February. It was also in February of 1991 when Paul Bearer made his first appearance in the WWF as The Undertaker's new manager. Brother Love passed The Undertaker on to Bearer on TV and Paul would end up becoming synonymous with The Undertaker character. When people think of the early days of The Undertaker, they usually think of Paul Bearer and not so much Brother Love. Soon afterwards, Paul Bearer and The Undertaker would have their own promo segment on WWF television known as The Funeral Parlor. WrestleMania was next and The Undertaker's winning streak began with a victory over Superfly Jimmy Snuka. Not one of Undertaker's greatest WrestleMania victories but still notable for being the very first. Almost immediately following WrestleMania, The Undertaker began working house shows with The Ultimate Warrior and Davy Boy Smith, with every single match ending in a DQ loss for the dead man. On the TV shows, Taker was still defeating enhancement guys, but soon enough he was put into a program with The Ultimate Warrior himself. Many will remember The Undertaker locking Warrior in a casket in the body bag challenge match that happened on TV, and this stuff was actually pretty entertaining. The body bag match though wasn't the first in the WWF, the Warrior and Undertaker had a ton of these matches on the house show loop before the match made its way to television. The 1991 King of the Ring saw Undertaker make it to the quarter finals. He defeated Road Warrior Animal in the first round, however he and Sid were double DQ'd in the quarter finals, meaning neither man moved on to the semis. Undertaker would then go on to work with the likes of Sid, Jim Duggan and Roddy Piper on the house shows, and he also got a televised win over Kerry Von Erich in October. So you can see here with the people that Undertaker was working against that he was being booked pretty strong as a heel. So from his debut at the 1990 Survivor Series right up until the 1991 edition of the same pay per view, Undertaker was pretty much dominant, with the Ultimate Warrior being the only guy to really give him a run for his money. The 1991 Survivor Series then saw Undertaker get a shot at Hulk Hogan's WWF Championship and The Undertaker won the match thanks to help from WWF newcomer Ric Flair. The Undertaker was now the WWF Champion but due to Flair's involvement in the match finish, a rematch was ordered between Hogan and Taker, this time happening at the This Tuesday in Texas pay per view event. At this Tuesday in Texas, Flair again tried to interfere and following a chaotic series of events, Hogan was able to pin The Undertaker. Jack Tunney though wouldn't let the win stand, so the belt was put up for grabs in the 1992 Royal Rumble match. Ric Flair won the title and The Undertaker wouldn't hold the WWF Championship again until 1997. I've always felt though that The Undertaker never needed the WWF belt. His character was so over and he was always a marquee attraction at big events that he didn't ever need to be in the title matches to me and I think the WWF felt the same way during these early years also. February of 1992 saw Undertaker turn babyface when he stopped his ally Jake Roberts from attacking Miss Elizabeth. A funeral parlor segment saw Undertaker solidify his new fan favourite status by telling Jake he was no longer on his side before running him off after a short scuffle. This led to Jake Roberts vs The Undertaker at WrestleMania 8, a match that I felt was better than the Snooker Mania match a year prior. Undertaker of course won this match. The remainder of 1992 for The Undertaker wasn't really that noteworthy unfortunately as The Undertaker worked against guys managed by Harvey Whippleman. He also worked against The Berserker on house shows and by the summer of 1992 he began a feud with Kamala. Summerslam in 92 saw Undertaker defeat Kamala via disqualification in Wembley Stadium, a match that didn't even reach the 4 minute mark but to be fair Undertaker had an excellent entrance during this show. 
At Survivor Series, Undertaker defeated Kamala in just over 5 minutes in their casket match. By this time though, the fans were very much behind The Undertaker and in just over 2 years, the WWF had built an extremely popular and marketable superstar. Undertaker kicked off 1993 with a main event appearance in the first ever episode of Monday Night Raw, defeating Damian Demento during the landmark show, and after this, Undertaker made his way to the 1993 Royal Rumble. The Undertaker entered the Rumble match at number 15 and quickly began eliminating superstars. Harvey Whippleman then appeared with an extremely large man by his side, later revealed to be the giant Gonzalez. I won't talk too much about Gonzalez here, that's for a different video, but Jan Gonzalez had worked in WCW prior to making his way to the WWF and, here in the Royal Rumble, Gonzalez attacked The Undertaker and threw him over the top rope, eliminating him from the match. This set up Undertaker's match with Gonzalez at WrestleMania 9, a match that some consider Undertaker's worst WrestleMania showdown. This match is noteworthy though for being the only Undertaker streak victory that was gained via disqualification, as during the match, Gonzalez used a chloroform soaked rag to take out The Undertaker. I didn't really like the match that much, and I know the comments will fill up with people saying it was great for one reason or another, so if you enjoyed Jan Gonzalez vs Undertaker at Mania 9, I'm happy for you. The feud would continue on with Whippleman bringing in Mr Hughes, a man who also had some matches with Taker on house shows, and also Mr Whippleman managed to gain control of Undertaker's iron, the source of his mystical powers. So Undertaker continued to work against Jan Gonzalez and Mr Hughes on house shows for around 2 months before stopping off at the USWA to take on Brian Christopher, the USWA Southern Heavyweight Champion in Memphis. They had 2 matches in June, with Brian winning both matches via disqualification. At SummerSlam 1993 then, The Undertaker defeated Jan Gonzalez in a rest in peace match, basically a no DQ match, and he also got the urn back. Taker then began a series of house show matches against WWF Champion Yokozuna before making his way to Survivor Series 93, where he was part of Lex Luger's winning Survivor Series team in the main event. Soon enough, The Undertaker would get a title shot on pay per view against Yokozuna at the 1994 Royal Rumble. So, by the time 1994 had came around, The Undertaker was firmly established as a main WWF attraction. The character was popular with fans, his ring style captivated younger audiences, and his reputation had grown backstage with the rest of the locker room. Hulk Hogan had left the WWF, Vince McMahon was prepping himself to go to trial over the juicing scandal, there was a new generation movement within the World Wrestling Federation on the cusp of becoming the leading television initiative, so things looked very different at the beginning of 1994 in comparison to when Taker first showed up in 1990. Yokozuna was the WWF Champion heading into the 1994 Royal Rumble, and The Undertaker would be getting a title shot at the pay per view. During this time period, The Undertaker had been dealing with back problems, and he needed to take time away from wrestling to heal up. So, with this in mind, The Undertaker vs Yokozuna casket match at the Royal Rumble was used as a sort of farewell match to The Undertaker. The match was indeed memorable, it done a lot to build anticipation for when The Undertaker would eventually return months down the line, and even in losing this match, The Undertaker became what this pay per view is mostly remembered for. The Undertaker had Yokozuna properly spooked in the run up to this match, and credit to Yokozuna, he played the part perfectly. From being apprehensive when he thought The Undertaker could be lurking around to legit falling down in fear when The Undertaker made an appearance, Yokozuna's work leading up to the Royal Rumble was great. The match itself was also pretty good, and again, credit to Yokozuna here. He wrestled differently during the early stages of this match, he was afraid of The Undertaker, but he knew he had to try and hurt him. The two, I felt, worked well together, and although everyone remembers the ending, there's also a good wrestling match here between Taker and Yokozuna. Anyway, towards the end of the match, 
Taker was about to close the casket on Yokozuna and win the WWF Championship, but Crush made an appearance and attacked The Undertaker. After Taker had taken out Crush, a bunch of heels ran to the ring to assist Yokozuna, and thanks to the mystical qualities of the urn, Undertaker was able to fight back. This led to even more bad guys running to the ring, and for a while, The Undertaker was easily defeating six guys at once. Soon enough though, it became too much, and the heels of the WWF took out The Undertaker, while Yokozuna took the urn away from Paul Bearer. It was the complete destruction of The Undertaker here, and with mercy, Yokozuna ended the match by rolling Taker into the casket. The heels began bringing the casket back up the entranceway, and just then, green smoke began coming out of the casket, the lights went out, and Undertaker appeared on the screens from inside the casket. Undertaker said that all of mankind will witness the rebirth of The Undertaker before announcing that he will not rest in peace. Just then, The Undertaker began levitating from the screen up to the rafters. Now, this was really cool and bonus points for the creativity, but the way this was shot for the viewers at home wasn't that great. It was hard to see the levitation because it was so dark. It maybe looked better in the arena, but at home, yeah, a bit more lighting could have helped. Still, take nothing away from this match at the Royal Rumble and the ending. People still remember the end of Yokozuna vs The Undertaker at this pay-per-view. So yeah, Undertaker was now gone to heal up his injuries. This would mean that Undertaker would miss WrestleMania 10 in Madison Square Garden, and it's kinda intriguing to think of where he could have slotted into the WrestleMania card of 1994. The WWF wouldn't just stop mentioning Taker on TV though, far from it. Instead, videos would air with people saying they spotted The Undertaker out and about as a wild hunt for the whereabouts of The Undertaker began on TV. This dude here said Taker came in to get some food and vanished. These ladies said that The Undertaker popped in to get a new solid gold urn. The firefighters said that they saw The Undertaker in a cloud of smoke. Even these kids said that they saw The Undertaker. Eventually, the million dollar man, Ted DiBiase, said that he would bring back the dead man. He knew where he was, and he would reintroduce him live on TV. DiBiase did bring The Undertaker back, but it wasn't The Undertaker we all knew. This Undertaker was not controlled by the urn, but he was controlled by money. Paul Bearer knew it wasn't the real Undertaker, and the younger fans at home, well, some still weren't too sure. This fake Undertaker was portrayed by primetime Brian Lee, a man who made a name for himself in Smoky Mountain Wrestling, and after this Undertaker business was done with, he would return to the WWF as Chains of the DOA. Brian Lee also worked for ECW during 1996 and early 1997, but yeah, most fans will know that this wasn't the real Undertaker. I'm sure all you guys watching knew it wasn't The Undertaker, but I must say that Bran Lee pulled the stunt off well. When you think of the limited options they had for guys to pull this off, I don't think the WWF could have picked anyone better than Bran Lee. Dubious about this fake Undertaker, Paul Bearer said that he would bring back the real Undertaker, and so we had a mystery on our hands, and a mystery like this needs Mr. Leslie Nielsen. Leslie had acted in the highly recommended spoof Naked Gun movies and the Police Squad TV show. If anyone was going to find the real Undertaker and get to the bottom of this mystery, it was the ever lovable Frank Drebin. Leslie promised us throughout a bunch of skits that he would solve the case at SummerSlam, and it just so happened that Ted DiBiase's Undertaker would face Paul Bearer's Undertaker at the same pay-per-view. Just a quick note on Leslie Nielsen here, I've read online that people didn't like his involvement, they found it goofy, along with the usual stigma with celebrities taking up TV time on wrestling shows. I wholeheartedly disagree with this, I loved his involvement. Yes, it was silly, but if you call this silly while sitting down to watch The Undertaker vs The Undertaker with a straight face as a grown adult, then I really don't know what to say. The Undertaker vs The Undertaker then at SummerSlam 1994. 
you have to watch this back with the eyes of a kid, really. It's easy for us to watch this now and complain about this gimmick match main eventing the biggest WWF pay-per-view of the summer, but as a kid who doesn't know any better, this stuff is totally nuts, and it's really what wrestling should be for the younger audience. It's fun. People tend to pick this match apart these days, doing deep dives into everything surrounding the match from Leslie's involvement beforehand, the fact that Bran Lee was smaller than Mark Calloway, the intricacies of the fake Undertaker's movements, I mean people take this really seriously. If you don't take it so seriously and you watch it for what it's supposed to be, a gimmick attraction match, then it's enjoyable. It isn't Flair vs Steamboat, it isn't Hart vs Austin, it's an attraction match. And also, as a kid, seeing the entrance of The Real Undertaker at SummerSlam 1994 was awesome and still to this day, this is one of my favourite Undertaker entrances with Paul Bear holding the spotlight urn and all that stuff. I'm not going to go into great detail here about the match, it was the classic Mortal Kombat mirror match with The Real Undertaker coming out on top and we had the real Undertaker back on our TV screen soon after. Taker replaced his grey and black outfit with a purple and black outfit, and we're off once again. Bruce Pritchard revealed a story about SummerSlam 1994 that's worth mentioning. Bret Hart took on his younger brother Owen Hart in a steel cage match, an excellent match in itself and really it needed to be. Those who get so offended by Undertaker vs Undertaker have Bret vs Owen beforehand, so there really shouldn't be any complaints. That being said, Bret and Owen went way over there a lot of time. Owen and Bret took an additional 20 minutes apparently, which is absolutely insane when you think about it, but this is what Bruce Pritchard said. Bret vs Owen went for a total of 32 minutes bell to bell, and Undertaker vs Undertaker went for around 8 minutes. Now think about it, really think about it, which match would you prefer to have gone on longer? When asked about Undertaker's reaction to Bret and Owen going overtime, Pritchard said, Undertaker was hot. Nobody was there for the confrontation because no one wanted to be there, but Taker did go and talk to Brett just to let him know he wasn't happy with it. It didn't get heated, Taker's not that kind of guy, but he did have a conversation with him that night. And no one was there, so there was no witnesses. The only people that know what happened are Undertaker and Brett. Immediately following SummerSlam 1994, Undertaker faced Crush and Yokozuna in a series of house show matches for around a month. Undertaker then got his revenge on Yokozuna on pay per view by defeating him in a casket match at the 1994 Survivor Series. This one I felt wasn't as good as the Royal Rumble encounter, their first match was much more memorable for sure. Taker would then go on to feud with Ted DiBiase's Million Dollar Corporation a feud that took up most of The Undertaker's 1995. The Royal Rumble then in 1995 saw Undertaker defeat IRS in a pretty forgettable match. After the showdown, King Kong Bundy distracted The Undertaker which allowed IRS to repossess the urn and take it away from Paul Bearer. So Ted DiBiase now had control of the urn, and WrestleMania 11 would see a continuation of the Undertaker vs Million Dollar Corporation feud as Taker squared off against King Kong Bundy on the grandest stage of them all. During the match, Undertaker got the urn back briefly, but Kama ran to the ring and stole it back, running off backstage while Undertaker was busy with Bundy. Undertaker of course scored the win at WrestleMania, but he had once again lost the urn. Kama ended up melting the urn into a chain necklace, and The Undertaker set out to get it back. On his road to SummerSlam, where The Undertaker would face Kama, Undertaker faced Mabel in the King of the Ring tournament at the King of the Ring pay per view. The Undertaker put Mabel over, and Mabel won the entire King of the Ring tournament. The Kama vs Undertaker match at SummerSlam 1995 probably meant a lot more to the men involved in the match than to us watching at home. Charles Wright and Mark Calloway were good friends backstage, and it must have been fun for both guys to work against each other here on pay per view. The two had already met previously of course, quite a lot on the house show loop, and also the two men faced each other in a dark match during the very first In Your House show. 
Again, at SummerSlam, we had another casket match though, and this one is different from past casket matches, thanks to it being a much more hotly contested wrestling match. Past casket matches felt a little gimmicky, and that's not a bad thing either, it's a gimmick match after all, but Kama and Undertaker decided to work a longer match here that was more about the fight than the actual casket. It's a decent match here, it's never really brought up and you should still check it out. Undertaker gets the win and he gets back his urn, albeit in chain form for a little while. While watching this match and realising it was much better than I remembered, I went online to see what the general reviews were for this match, just to see what others thought about it. I ran into an article that went through all of Undertaker's SummerSlam opponents on denofgeek.com. Yes, these guys are clearly not the authority on wrestling matches, but they are a huge pop culture website and they get a ton of traffic. Anyway, here's what they wrote in regards to The Undertaker vs Kama at SummerSlam 95. Undertaker's SummerSlam opponents didn't get much better. In 1995, his lengthy feud with Ted DiBiase's million dollar corporation came to an end when he took on Kama, the supreme fighting machine. Keep in mind, by this point, he had already dealt with an evil Undertaker and King Kong Bundy. This is like playing through a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles video game, getting past Shredder and Krang, then having to defeat Bebop in the final level. It was a casket match and to add some flavour to the battle, Kama had stolen the urn and had it melted down into gold chains. I can't fault the man for style. Kama, otherwise known as Papa Shango and the Godfather, is one of the worst performers in the company's history, so this fight was borderline unwatchable. So there you have it folks, according to Den of Geek, Charles Wright was one of the worst performers in WWF history and the casket match at SummerSlam is unwatchable. I know for a fact the Charles Wright statement is so far off the mark that it's ridiculous and I can't change anyone's opinion on the SummerSlam casket match, but make up your own minds and watch it. I've watched a ton of wrestling in my lifetime, and calling Kama vs The Undertaker unwatchable is as equally as ridiculous to me as saying Kama was one of the worst wrestlers in the company. And you may very well agree with this guy, but calling Kama one of the worst WWF performers in history, especially when discussing a 1995 WWF match, I just find this insanely off the mark. But anyway, let's get back on track. Following SummerSlam, The Undertaker suffered a broken orbital bone, an injury that was caused by King Mabel. In normal circumstances, this would lead to a lengthy hiatus from wrestling to allow the superstar to heal, but the WWF were going through some hard times here and Taker soldiered on. The WWF decided to kayfabe the injury a little by having The Undertaker wear a mask adding it to the story, whereas the mask was really being worn not to cause any further damage. I loved The Undertaker's mask, it doesn't get talked about too much these days, but I thought it looked really cool. The WWF put it across that a series of leg drops from Mabel caused the injury, but in reality it was a botched clothesline. A month later, Taker came back to TV wearing the mask. At the Survivor Series in 1995 then, Taker led his Survivor Series team featuring Fatu, Savio Vega and Henry Godwin into a match against Jerry Lawler, Hunter Hearst Helmsley, Isaac Yankum and King Mabel. Taker's team scored the victory. What you should note here though is that Undertaker's team were all part of the Bone Street crew, a group of friends who hung out together backstage and drove together from town to town. Also of note here is that this was really the last King Mabel match to hold any sort of relevance. The injury to Undertaker's face pretty much sealed his fate. In his final Raw appearance then of 1995, The Undertaker defeated Isaac Yankum DDS, a man who would play a huge part in The Undertaker's story in the years that followed. So our previous video ended at 1995, The Undertaker was wearing his Phantom of the Opera style mask at the time and he was also due a WWF title shot. Bret the Hitman Hart had won the championship from Big Daddy Cool Diesel at the 1995 Survivor Series so The Undertaker would get his opportunity at the 1996 Royal Rumble. Diesel, on the other hand, would have to enter the Royal Rumble to try and earn a WWF Championship rematch. 
HBK Shawn Michaels eliminated Diesel to win the Royal Rumble match and afterwards Diesel wasn't too happy but still he celebrated with Shawn after the match. After the Royal Rumble match we had Bret Hart vs The Undertaker for the WWF Championship. While I feel their SummerSlam 1997 encounter was better, this Taker vs Bret match was also pretty good, however the ending just didn't feel decisive. I will say though that there was definitely an unpredictable feeling about this match, seeing as Undertaker had been pretty dominant going into 1996. As Taker was making his way to the ring, Diesel stood at the entranceway to stop the dead man in his tracks. Diesel felt annoyed about not winning the Royal Rumble and missing out on an opportunity to face the champion at Mania and so he traded blows with The Undertaker before the championship match got underway. Anyway, the match began, it was quite good and interesting to see a babyface vs babyface main event but again, SummerSlam 1997 is your match if you want to see Bret vs Taker. Notable here though is that during this match, Bret Hart removed The Undertaker's mask and this would be the last time we would see the mask on the dead man. Undertaker had the match won after nailing Bret with a tombstone, but Diesel came back and pulled the ref out of the ring during the three count. The ref disqualified Bret, Undertaker wins the match, but not the WWF Championship. Diesel flipped The Undertaker off and walked back up the entranceway, so in short, the Undertaker was robbed at the 1996 Royal Rumble. Immediately following the Royal Rumble, Gorilla Monsoon announced that Diesel would get his WWF Championship rematch from the Survivor Series at the next In Your House pay-per-view, so it seemed like Diesel was getting rewarded here for interfering in Taker's match. Diesel had an interview afterwards where he said he got involved in the Undertaker's match just to prove that he was number one, and he also told Taker that he wasn't afraid of the dark. Before getting to In Your House in the cage match between Bret Hart and Diesel, Bret and The Undertaker had a WWF Championship rematch on Raw. Diesel was at the commentary desk for this match and the match itself was actually really good. The referee got took out when Taker went for a tombstone and Diesel used this opportunity to take out both Bret and The Undertaker. So again, we had another good match with an indecisive finish. So on to In Your House in February of 1996 and Bret defended his title against Diesel in the cage. Notable about this match here is that the crowd was also cheering for Diesel. Plenty of times there were loud Diesel chants in the audience, even though he was booked as a strong heel here, feuding with both Bret Hart and The Undertaker. Anyway, Diesel had the match won, he was about to exit the cage door, but Undertaker appeared from under the ring and he grabbed Diesel, which allowed Bret to escape the cage and win the match. When Diesel and Taker re-emerged from under the ring, Big Daddy Cool quickly ran away and the show went off the air. The following night on Raw, Undertaker had a match with Tatanka. During the match, Diesel came out holding an axe and he grabbed a cameraman to go backstage. After the commercial break, we saw Diesel destroying the Undertaker's casket while Taker continued to work against Tatanka in the ring. Taker got the win and he was able to see Diesel destroying the casket on the big screen. The dead man went backstage but Diesel had already left. All that remained were the broken pieces of the casket. Paul Bearer warned Diesel that he would pay for his actions. The following week on Raw, The Undertaker vs Diesel was officially announced for WrestleMania 12. Diesel also had a match on this night against Bob Holly, and during the showdown, Diesel would continually look over his shoulder. The paranoia of The Undertaker showing up seemed to be getting at Big Daddy Cool. Diesel won the match and seemed pleased that Taker didn't show up, so he made his way back up the entranceway. Just then, the lights went out and Undertaker appeared in the ring. Diesel turned around to go after Taker, but the lights went out again and Taker had vanished. Undertaker appeared on the big screen, telling Diesel that if he wants to play mind games, then Big Daddy Cool will play mind games with the master. Looking back now, I thought this was really well done and added a nice touch to the story. The Undertaker's mission was to make Big Daddy Cool lose his cool.
The March 18th edition of Raw then, and it didn't take long for Diesel to lose his cool. Diesel was booked into a match with Barry Horowitz, Diesel was still paranoid, checking under the ring before starting the match and all that stuff. But early into the match, Paul Bearer came to ringside with a casket. Diesel naturally thought that The Undertaker was in the casket, but what he would find was maybe even more disturbing than the dead man himself. After beating Barry Horowitz with a punch to the face, and no I'm not making that up, Diesel approached the casket. Diesel opened the casket and he saw himself. One of the most creepy things the WWF have ever done here. It was really, really good. And Diesel looked totally freaked out afterwards. His reaction was believable. He didn't know what to do. So how was this chilling stunt pulled off? Camera work and editing is your answer. The shot of Diesel in the casket was pre-recorded, so that is the real Kevin Nash you see in the casket. The show quickly cut to this pre-recorded spot for a brief second, then went back to the arena to capture Diesel's reaction. What you see here is a mannequin dummy, and what you see here during the close-up is Kevin Nash himself. Many people said it was actually Glenn Jacobs in the casket during the shots right here, but Bruce Pritchard revealed on his podcast that it was actually a dummy. Who knows, it seems weird that we never get to see the dummy any other time, like in candid photos or backstage photos and things like that, but I prefer to take a producer's word on things like this if we have no other definitive explanation. All in all, it was an excellent piece of work here and it was definitely freaky. One of the better Undertaker supernatural moments in WWF history and one that doesn't get brought up all too often. The following week, the final Raw before WrestleMania, Paul Bearer and The Undertaker had an in-ring interview with Vince McMahon. Paul Bearer explained that this all started because Diesel cost Undertaker the championship back at the Royal Rumble. Undertaker said that after WrestleMania, all that will remain is the carcass of Big Daddy Cool. Undertaker said that he won't just beat Diesel at Mania, but he will also take his soul. WrestleMania 12 then, and I honestly feel that Diesel vs The Undertaker is quite underrated. For two big guys, it's a pretty physical match that hits nearly 17 minutes. Diesel was able to hit two jackknife powerbombs on The Undertaker, but it wasn't enough, and The Undertaker left WrestleMania 12 with a victory, 5-0 at WrestleMania. Up to this point, this was The Undertaker's best WrestleMania match, I feel, and even though Kevin Nash had already given his notice, he didn't get lazy here and maybe this was out of respect for his opponent, both he and Undertaker had a good showing here. There's also a lot of speculation in regards to the outcome of this match being different had Diesel not gave his notice. Kevin Nash even said recently that there's a possibility he would have ended the streak had things been differently when he said, If I would have stayed, I wouldn't have dropped the belt to Brett to give to Sean unless I was guaranteed a win at Mania against Taker. I wouldn't have done it, no. I would have had too many losses in a row. I would have needed a big win right there, so there goes the streak. Mark, in reference to The Undertaker, wasn't a Mark. He would have done it. I'm not saying it would have happened, I'm not saying Vince would have booked it, but I definitely wouldn't have coughed it up without something in regards to the WWF Championship. This match ended the Diesel vs Undertaker feud and next up for The Undertaker was Mankind, kicking off a feud that would last years and become revered in the wrestling world. Vignettes had been airing for weeks signalling that Mankind was on his way to the WWF and the night after WrestleMania, Mankind showed up and destroyed Bob Holly. Undertaker main evented this episode of Raw against Justin Hawk Bradshaw and after Taker delivered the tombstone, Mankind stormed to the ring and led out The Undertaker. Mankind totally decimated the dead man here with Mick Foley being positioned as a real threat to the legend of The Undertaker. Over the coming weeks, Mankind would continue to interfere in Undertaker's matches, gaining the upper hand each and every time. At the 1996 King of the Ring then, Mankind defeated The Undertaker when Paul Bearer accidentally hit Taker with the urn, allowing Mankind to apply the mandible claw and Undertaker lost via TKO. 
Undertaker got an Intercontinental title shot against Goldust at In Your House Beware of Dog, kickstarting a secondary feud here which would run at the same time as Undertaker vs Mankind. At Beware of Dog, Taker and Goldust met in a casket match, and just when Taker was ready to win the match, Mankind appeared from the casket, costing The Undertaker the Intercontinental title. After Beware of Dog, we went to Vancouver for In Your House International Incident, a show that featured an Undertaker vs Goldust rematch. Again, in this match, Mankind interfered by emerging from the ring and applying the Mandible Claw to the Phenom. Mankind came back up and it seemed like he had lost the Undertaker somewhere underneath the ring, and just then, Taker emerged from the other side of the ring. A brawl broke out between Mankind and Undertaker, leading all the way to the arena boiler room. After the show, Gorilla Monsoon announced that Mankind and Undertaker would face each other in a boiler room brawl at SummerSlam 1996. On his way to SummerSlam, Undertaker had a match with Stone Cold Steve Austin on the July 29th episode of Raw. Before Undertaker could get the win against Austin, Mankind came to ringside, causing Undertaker to get counted out and Stone Cold got the win. Undertaker returned to the ring and informed Mankind that at SummerSlam, the Reaper will enter the Serpent's Lair. The Boiler Room Brawl was an interesting match. The whole thing was pre-recorded, and the WWF hadn't really done many matches of this nature with the exception of maybe the Hollywood Backlot Brawl at WrestleMania 12, where the majority of the showdown takes place backstage and ends in the ring. Back then, these kind of matches were novel, but they were also really cool to watch at home. I mentioned before that the Boiler Room Brawl has been surpassed in the years that followed, but back then, this was some great stuff. Anyway, Taker and Mankind battled around the arena boiler room and beyond, destroying each other with whatever items they could find lying around, with Mick Foley taking some ludicrous bumps in the process. To win the match, a competitor had to leave the boiler room and retrieve the urn from Paul Bearer. When Undertaker got to the ring, the unthinkable happened when Paul Bearer turned on the dead man, siding with Mankind here and allowing Mick Foley to score the win. A good match here for its time, it created a lot of buzz with the actual match itself and with Paul Bearer parting ways with The Undertaker. The end of the match was indeed shocking, Mankind now had possession of the urn and Paul Bearer had left The Undertaker after all these years. The following night on Raw, it was announced that Mankind had earned himself a WWE Championship match against Shawn Michaels at In Your House Mind Games. During Mankind's in-ring interview on this night, the lights began flickering in the arena, and all of a sudden, the lights went out. A group of druids carried The Undertaker to ringside, laying him down on the floor. Paul Bear said that The Undertaker was dead, but the Phenom sat up and got to his feet, causing some pyro to go off in the ring as Mankind and Paul Bear ran away. It was clear that The Undertaker would continue on without the urn and without Paul Bearer. After Shawn Michaels defeated Mankind at In Your House Mind Games in an excellent match, The Undertaker appeared from a coffin at ringside, attacking Mankind as the audience in attendance went totally nuts. The Taker vs Mankind feud would move on to the next chapter at In Your House in October. The main event would be the first ever Buried Alive match, pitting the Dead Man vs Mankind in the first ever match of this kind. No one knew what to expect here, but commentators told us on Raw that a real cemetery would be built in the arena and the only way to win the match was to bury your opponent alive. This brought a great deal of intrigue to October's In Your House pay-per-view. The weeks leading up to the pay-per-view showed Undertaker digging Mankind's grave in pre-taped vignettes, while Mankind was shown exhibiting fear about possibly being buried alive at In Your House. At the pay-per-view, there was a gravesite set up beside the entranceway, and yes, the loser of the match would indeed get buried alive. More intrigue was added thanks to the WWF and Storyline not sanctioning the match, the first time this was ever done in the WWF. This meant, according to Vince McMahon on the headset, that the WWF would not take responsibility for what could happen during the match. Good stuff. Due to interference from the Executioner, better known as Terry Gordy of the Fabulous Freebirds, and other heels of the WWF, Mankind was able to get the win over The Undertaker when the numbers got too much for the dead man. 
This was very reminiscent of the 1994 Royal Rumble when the heels took out The Undertaker in the casket match, showing here that a great way to defeat the dead man is with strength and numbers. After the match, an iconic moment in the history of The Undertaker occurred when his hand rose above the dirt, signalling that The Undertaker wasn't dead just yet. When Taker returned one month later at the Survivor Series, he had a brand new look as the evolution of the Undertaker character took another step forward. So at the 1996 Survivor Series, it was announced that Undertaker will return to face mankind. This time, Paul Bear would be suspended above the ring in a cage, and if Taker won, he would get his hands on his former manager. Undertaker's entrance was spectacular, coming to the ring from the rafters while spreading his bat wings as he slowly descended into the ring. Taker was now wearing all black leather, he had a fake teardrop tattoo placed below his right eye, and he looked totally different. There's been speculation over why he had this teardrop with no sources ever being quoted, from losing a close friend to the end of the Paul Bear relationship being mentioned as reasons, so I'm not even going to get into it, it's never been explained, I just thought it was a nice addition to the new Taker character. Undertaker won this match, and I can remember being shocked seeing the VHS of Survivor Series 1996, as the Sky Sports broadcast here in the UK had cut this match way down to around two and a half minutes, no joke. I always thought this was a squash match for the longest time, until I bought the VHS, and seeing it in all its glory made me question other pay-per-view matches I had watched on Sky Sports in the past. Still, a good match here. Taker didn't get his hands on Paul Bearer though. Instead, the Executioner came to the ring, allowing Paul to make an escape. This set up the Executioner versus The Undertaker at In Your House It's Time in December, a match that The Undertaker won. Just going back to the Survivor Series match briefly, I recently done a Survivor Series 1996 watch along for the Wrestling Bios channel supporters, and watching this back made me realise how good Paul Bearer was at hamming it up. He was really funny before the match where he refused to get into the cage, and also he was really really good in the pre-match promo. Good stuff. The Taker vs Executioner match at In Your House It's Time was billed as an Armageddon rules match. Basically a last man standing match but you had to get a pinfall or submission before the ref started the 10 count. Old school fans would know these matches were billed previously as Texas death matches. Mankind attempted to interfere in this match leading to security coming down and spraying mace in Mankind's eyes. Why this happened, I don't know, it was an ODQ match. Security also put a straitjacket on Mankind, but anyway, after battling around and outside the arena, The Undertaker nailed the tombstone and the Executioner was unable to answer the 10 count after the pinfall. Take away the stuff with security missing Mankind and all that, and you have yourself another underrated and fun match here. As normal, 1997 started with the usual build towards the Royal Rumble. Taker's first televised match of the year occurred on the January 13th episode of Raw, however the match was taped on the 30th of December 1996. Undertaker took on Crush here. It was announced as Undertaker walked to the ring that he would be facing Vader at the Royal Rumble pay-per-view in a singles match, and also Undertaker would be entering the Royal Rumble match itself. Undertaker won via DQ here on Raw when the Nation of Domination and Vader hit the ring and attacked the dead man. This Royal Rumble match here in 1997 is one I feel I've talked about loads of times, but I honestly don't mind. It was one of the more entertaining WWF events at the time. The Vader vs Undertaker match here was decent, it was very watchable, but these two men would have a better match a few months down the line on pay per view, but a little more on that later. Vader got in a ton of offense here, but The Undertaker managed to turn the tides, and just as Taker was going for the choke slam, he noticed Paul Bearer coming to the ring. After laying a few punches into his former manager, Bearer stayed at ringside and assisted Vader where he could, and after Paul hit Undertaker with the urn, Vader was able to pick up the victory. Vader and Paul Bearer left the ring together, so it seems that Vader had just found himself a new manager. 
In the Royal Rumble match, Stone Cold Steve Austin decided to slide back into the ring after getting eliminated. The referees didn't see Austin get thrown over the top rope, and Stone Cold went on to eliminate Vader, Undertaker and Bret Hart to win the entire Rumble match. Bret Hart was very annoyed, and the next night on Raw, he decided to quit the WWF because of this injustice. To entice Bret Hart back, WWF President Gorilla Monsoon announced that a final four match would happen at the next In Your House pay-per-view to decide the real number one contender for the WWF Championship. The final four match would feature the three men Steve Austin eliminated at the end of the Royal Rumble, Bret Hart, Vader and The Undertaker, and the match would also feature Stone Cold Steve Austin himself. The rules of this elimination match were quite unique. A superstar could get eliminated by pinfall, submission, and also a superstar could get eliminated by being thrown over the top rope. There were also no disqualifications. Before getting to the final four match, The Undertaker wrestled Steve Austin on this same episode of Raw, and it ended when all final four participants brawled in the ring. Shawn Michaels would forfeit his WWF Championship because he lost his smile, and so the winner of the Final Four would be named the WWF Champion. There's something about these In Your House shows from late 96 to mid 97 where you can tell the WWF were trying to cut corners and save money, from the entranceways to the broadcast feed quality. The presentation these days is enough to turn some fans off, but whatever you do, don't sleep on In Your House Final Four. The main event match pitting The Undertaker against Bret Hart, Vader and Steve Austin is one of the best matches of the year, and that says a lot considering 1997 was packed with good stuff. The participants took advantage of the no disqualification rule, Vader got busted open in a bad way, and during the entirety of the match, it was really hard to pick out a winner, all four men had a great night here. Anyway, the noise of the audience is totally insane when we got down to the final two, Bret Hart and The Undertaker. Taker nails the choke slam on Bret Hart and goes for a tombstone, but the eliminated Steve Austin was hell bent on still trying to attack Bret Hart. Austin got on the apron and The Undertaker punched Austin to get him out of the way, allowing Bret Hart to take advantage of the situation and clothesline Taker over the top rope to win the WWF Championship. I can't say it enough, if you haven't seen this match, get on it as soon as possible. Bret Hart dropped the WWF title the very next night on Raw to Psycho Sid, and it was also announced that The Undertaker would be the number one contender for the championship at WrestleMania. The Sid vs Undertaker match at WrestleMania 13 definitely wasn't one of my favourite Mania Taker matches. I know there are people out there who like this match and that's absolutely fine, there's stuff I like that I'm sure others don't, but this match here just didn't do it for me at all. Taker though had his work cut out for him, not only was he going up against Sid here, but the classic Bret Hart vs Steve Austin match also happened on this night, and that match was insanely good. I also don't blame Taker for the match being a little underwhelming, he had worked with big guys in the past and gotten good to great matches out of them, from Yokozuna to Diesel, but the pace was kept incredibly slow during this Mania 13 match, it can be a bit of a chore to sit through. One thing I will say that was pretty cool though, The Undertaker came out wearing his old black and grey ring attire, the same gear he wore during his debut years in the WWF. Anyway, Taker was able to capture the WWF Championship here for the second time in his career after nailing the tombstone. Bret Hart would get involved in the match a few times and yeah, not much else to say. The visual of Undertaker holding the belt to end WrestleMania 13 though was good to see. The fans loved it and it also gave us this iconic photo. The next night on Raw, Undertaker was featured in the final segment in an interview spot. Undertaker welcomed the fans to the dark days of the World Wrestling Federation, saying he is prepared to defend the title against all challengers. Mankind was announced as the number one contender for the title, and Undertaker admitted that Mankind was the most dangerous man in the WWF. Paul Bearer walked down the ramp, Mankind appeared on the screen asking Paul not to leave him, and the show went off the air before we could get an idea of what was going on. It appeared that Paul Bearer was trying to get back in The Undertaker's good books while also leaving Mankind, 
but we would need to wait for a week before finding out. The next week then, Paul Bearer came to the ring and said he made a mistake in leaving The Undertaker's side, and he wanted to once again stand side by side with the dead man. Taker came to the ring and he said that betrayal is something he will never forget, but it may be something he could forgive. Taker said he owes Paul Bearer for all the years that they stood together in the past, and it seemed like the two men were going to reunite, but Taker ended up punching Paul Bearer. Undertaker began stalking Paul around the outside, and that's when Mankind appeared from under the ring. Mankind then shot a fireball into the Undertaker's eyes. At In Your House, Revenge of the Taker then, the Undertaker did indeed get his revenge when Paul Bearer was on the receiving end of a fireball. While there are better Mankind vs Taker matches out there, this match at Revenge of the Taker is still worth your time. The May 12th, 1997 episode of Raw then would kickstart the next career changing storyline of The Undertaker. Now, normally here I would tell you guys that I've covered this already and direct you to another video, but I know some people don't really like that and would prefer if everything is covered in one neat video. So I'm going to show some clips from a previous video here I made on the introduction of Kane, so you guys won't need to click back and forth. At the Revenge of the Taker show, Paul got a fireball thrown in his face by The Undertaker. On the May 12th, 1997 episode of Raw, a comically bandaged Paul Bearer and Mankind made their way to the ring to make an announcement. Paul Bearer said, You remember, Undertaker? Oh yes you do. I'm going to give you one chance, one more chance for us to get back together. If you do not accept this final offer, I'm going to do something that only you know about Undertaker. The secret that only you know. I'm going to reveal your secret to the whole world. You hurt me Undertaker. Come back or I'm going to hurt you. So we were left wondering what on earth Paul Bearer could have been talking about here. Undertaker made his way to the ring the following week on Raw, and in an interview segment with Vince McMahon, Paul Bearer appeared on the Titan Tron, demanding that Undertaker comes back to him, or the secret will be revealed. Undertaker asked for more time, and Bearer gave Undertaker another 7 days to make his decision. Of course, this was a tactic to get people to tune in again a week later. So let's jump to the following week, the May 26th episode of Raw. At the end of the show, Paul made his way to the ring. Paul said that the secret had been burning in him for years, making references to Undertaker's family and how Paul had promised the Undertaker's parents, at their graves, that he would never reveal this secret. Before Paul could say any more, Undertaker quickly made his way to the ring. Undertaker said that he hates Paul Bearer and he hates what he has to do on this night. Undertaker then grabbed Paul Bearer by the throat and we all thought Taker was about to destroy him, but as Raw went off the air, the Undertaker let go and he sided with his old manager. There were more questions than answers here and the whole thing kept viewers tuning in to see the story unfold. The following week on Raw, we learned that the Undertaker and Paul Bearer relationship would be a rocky one. Paul Bearer said that Undertaker would now be his personal item of destruction and Undertaker was only allowed to do what Paul Bearer said. In the weeks that followed, the Undertaker found it very difficult to take orders from Paul Bearer and on the June 30th 1997 edition of Raw, Paul Bearer made his way to the ring and the secret would be revealed. So during this promo, Paul Bearer said, We are talking about a little funeral home, a family owned funeral home. The father was the mortician, the mother was the secretary, and there were two little kids there. One kid was a little red headed punk, and then there was a second kid, a sweet little kid named Kane. I was the apprentice at the funeral home. The Undertaker's father was a mortician of excellence, he taught me everything I know. But while I was working at that funeral home, I noticed a lot of things going on. That little red-headed punk, there was something funny about him. He had a look in his eye, the look of the devil. What was so sad about the whole situation was that poor little Kane followed Undertaker everywhere he went. 
Undertaker was Kane's hero. Anything The Undertaker did was fine. My apprenticeship went on for about two years. The Undertaker and Kane would run around the funeral home like wild men. They'd sneak behind the garage, smoking cigarettes. But one particular afternoon, I was leaving to go to school. I look behind me, and who do I see? That little red-headed devil seed, The Undertaker, and his little brother. Something didn't seem right, but I went to school. I came back that night, and what do I see? I see fire trucks, I see ambulances, I see smoke, I see the funeral home in ashes. Someone burned down the funeral home. Inside the funeral home was the family who took care of me. I looked at the bushes and who do I see? I see the Undertaker. Undertaker, you burnt the funeral home down to the ground. Undertaker, you are a murderer. Later in the night we are shown The Undertaker backstage. Undertaker said he was not responsible for setting fire to the funeral home. Undertaker said his parents and Kane were in the funeral home when it burned down, but he was not responsible for starting the fire. And it was actually Kane who started the blaze. Undertaker stated that when Paul Bearer forced him to look at the charred remains of his mother, it changed him forever, and he took it upon himself to become the Undertaker character that we all know today. Sounds fucking ridiculous as I say this now, but to be fair, The Undertaker done a great job here during this promo. It was also revealed later that Kane was Bearer's illegitimate son and The Undertaker's half-brother. Paul would say that Kane is actually alive. Paul said that parts of Kane's body were disfigured and he was unable to go outside into the sunlight. Paul also said that for years, Cain has always dreamed of coming face to face with his brother in order to get his revenge. We were then teased in the weeks that followed that Cain was going to indeed show up. Undertaker started a feud with Shawn Michaels after HBK cost Taker the WWF Championship at SummerSlam 1997. After their match at In Your House Ground Zero ended in an old contest, the first ever Hell in a Cell match was booked for In Your House Bad Blood. We all kind of knew that Kane was going to show up at Bad Blood. The Kane debut had been teased for so long by this time, and the TV advertisements promoting the show kind of gave it away also. During these commercials, Paul Bearer could be seen saying the words, He's coming, dead man, referring to the arrival of Kane. With this in mind, the first ever Hell in a Cell match featuring Shawn Michaels vs The Undertaker at Bad Blood was so captivating that Kane was the last thing on my mind anyway as the match played out. In the final moments of the match, when Undertaker was about to defeat Shawn Michaels, the lights went out in the arena. We heard the church organ introduction to Kane's entrance theme for the very first time, and out walked Paul Bearer and Kane, Glenn Jacobs new and most successful character. Cain proceeded to rip the door off the Hell in a Cell structure as The Undertaker looked on in shock. Cain delivered a tombstone pile driver to The Undertaker and walked away as Shawn Michaels took advantage and pinned the dead man. Now that we have the introduction of Cain out of the way, it's only fair that we take a few steps back to before The Undertaker lost the championship, as there were some notable matches here that need discussed. At In Your House, A Cold Day in Hell, live from the Richmond Coliseum, The Undertaker successfully defended his WWF Championship against Stone Cold Steve Austin. Again, a decent match, but not the best showdown that these two had. This one was more centred around the Austin vs Hart Foundation feud. Next up, we had The King of the Ring, where Nation member Farouk would get a chance to become the WWF Champion. Undertaker got the win in this one when Farouk got distracted by his Nation teammates fighting on the outside. At In Your House Canadian Stampede, The Undertaker and Vader once again squared off in the ring, and this match I felt was better than their Royal Rumble encounter from around 6 months prior. Undertaker was victorious here too, the two men worked hard throughout the whole match and it comes recommended. The Bret Hart vs Undertaker match too at Summerslam where Undertaker drops the belt is worth watching. It has much more heat than their Royal Rumble 1996 encounter and it also had a great sense of unpredictability. The ending too was quite surprising when special referee Shawn Michaels hit Taker accidentally with a vicious chair shot. 
This finish was expertly done. Sean didn't necessarily want Bret Hart to win, but he had no choice. He had to count Taker's shoulders to the mat after nailing him with a chair. Along with this, the match itself as a complete package was extremely good also. So there were title defences here against Austin, Farouk, Vader and Bret Hart on pay per view but the whole Kane secret storyline overshadowed what was happening in the ring. This is why I feel Taker's title run here was maybe not as good as it could have been. Don't get me wrong, the dead man was doing some phenomenal work in the ring in 1997 and it's good to see a champion defend against a range of different wrestlers, something that is sometimes lost in today's WWE, but the Kane and Paul Bearer stuff was at the forefront here, meaning the focus of the actual title reign was given the back seat in terms of storytelling. Bret Hart winning the championship at Summerslam, I feel, was the right move. The Undertaker vs Kane program definitely didn't need the championship, there was enough meat on that bone already. One thing is for sure though, throughout the entirety of Undertaker's title reign and beyond, not once did fan support waver. The Undertaker was a consistent fan favourite throughout the entire year. After wrestling Shawn Michaels at In Your House Ground Zero and after the excellent Hell in a Cell match at Bad Blood, all focus was put on Kane vs The Undertaker. Paul Bearer and Kane would try to goad Undertaker into fighting his younger brother but Taker would refuse, saying he wouldn't fight his own flesh and blood. With this in mind, Undertaker ended his pay per view year by facing Jeff Jarrett at In Your House Degeneration X and yeah, it felt like Taker and Jarrett were just wasting time in the ring here until Kane showed up. When the Big Red Machine did make an appearance, he came to the ring, looked at his brother and slapped him across the face to try and get Taker to fight back. Undertaker wouldn't retaliate, so Kane and Paul Bearer simply walked away. Jeff Jarrett won by disqualification here, but Taker did drop Jeff with a choke slam after the match. So our last Undertaker video ended with the debut of Kane. Kane would completely torment the WWF during his initial months within the company while The Undertaker would consistently refuse to fight his brother. It felt like The Undertaker was really the only man who could stop Kane but Taker had no interest in fighting his own flesh and blood. At the very beginning of 1998, the storyline remained the same, however there was a glimmer of hope. Shawn Michaels, the WWF Champion, would be defending his title against The Undertaker at the 1998 Royal Rumble in Undertaker's trademark match, the casket match, and to try to get an upper hand, Shawn Michaels and Degeneration X would try to enlist Kane, making The Undertaker's brother the newest member of DX. Undertaker came to the ring on the January 12th 1998 episode of Raw and he told Shawn Michaels not to involve Kane in their business, leading to DX beating down The Undertaker in the middle of the ring. Kane then made his way down the ramp and this was interesting because we didn't know what Kane was going to do. Instead of joining DX, the Big Red Machine assisted The Undertaker and for a moment it looked like Kane and The Undertaker were on the same page, giving us this classic moment when both men saluted each other as Kane walked back up the rampway. Next up then was the 1998 Royal Rumble, another casket match for the dead man. This one was memorable for two reasons. First, we had Shawn Michaels taking that back body drop and clipping his back on the casket and this would lead to Shawn's early retirement just a few months later. Secondly, the ending was memorable due to The Undertaker getting locked inside the casket and the casket itself getting set on fire by Kane signalling yet another demise of The Undertaker at a Royal Rumble event, and again in a casket match. Obviously The Undertaker wasn't successful here, Kane and The Undertaker were not on the same page as we initially thought, and the plan was now to finally have The Undertaker face Kane at WrestleMania 14. This casket match though at the Royal Rumble 1998 is still worth your time, it isn't my favourite Shawn vs Taker match but they told a good story here. This match then, featuring Kane and The Undertaker, would be used as a main attraction going into WrestleMania. People were legitimately excited to see this battle go down. 
The Undertaker didn't have any television matches after the 1998 Royal Rumble, but he did work house shows and dark matches. The dark matches even saw him face Kane, albeit in tag team showdowns. Meanwhile, Kane would have a brief feud with Vader to pass time until WrestleMania. The March 2nd episode of Raw though saw The Undertaker return to challenge Kane at WrestleMania. This return here was really well done, with a lightning bolt hitting a casket that was set up at the entranceway and The Undertaker rising once again. Undertaker speaking without a microphone too in the arena was a great touch. Undertaker said he will do the one thing he promised he would never do, he would face Kane, even demonstrating during this promo that he would legitimately walk through the fires of hell to stop his little brother. A real Undertaker moment here that doesn't get talked about all that often then. Two weeks later, The Undertaker appeared on the top of the Titantron when Kane was about to attack Sable, making a coffin go up in flames as he told his little brother that all he can do now is rest in peace. Let's look at the WrestleMania 14 match then, Kane vs The Undertaker. This one is special because it's the first match, on TV anyway, featuring The Undertaker squaring off against Kane. It definitely has its place in the history books, but the match itself, in my opinion, could have been much better. You have to remember that the Kane storyline started all the way back in April of 1997, around a month shy of a complete year of building up here, so there was this substantial amount of pressure to make sure the match was spectacular. Keep in mind too that the WWF would be banking on further Undertaker vs Kane matches to attract audiences down the road. WrestleMania was never really in jeopardy of low pay-per-view numbers thanks to the upcoming title reign of Steve Austin along with Mike Tyson's involvement, the WWF making sure to recover after WrestleMania 13 here, so it was important that Kane and The Undertaker delivered. Don't get me wrong, it's still a good match. But there was something missing here that stopped these two having that classic Wrestlemania moment. It's a shame too, both men had all the momentum in the world going into Wrestlemania 14 and I also know people will dismiss my opinion here and call this match a classic but it didn't do it for me and even watching it back now you just know both men were capable of so much more. It's telling that people remember Pete Rose getting tombstoned by Kane at the beginning of the match more than the match itself, and on that subject too, as funny as it was as the years went on, having Kane get involved with Pete Rose, I felt, hurt the mystique of the Kane character. Pete Rose was also out there being a heel before Kane took him out, so the audience were cheering for Kane before The Undertaker even made his way to the ring. But that's being a little nitpicky also. Undertaker won the match at WrestleMania after three tombstones. Kane attacked Taker after the match and hit a tombstone on a steel chair to keep the feud going. And there's arguments to be made here too that maybe Kane should have been the one that left with the victory. But anyway, let's move on. I don't want to leave this match saying I didn't think it was good. It was a good match, but I feel it could have been better. And get better it did. The very next month at WWF Unforgiven, The Undertaker and Kane were booked in a first of its kind match, an Inferno match. This match brought a great deal of intrigue with it and I remember being very curious about how this would play out. The ring was legitimately surrounded with fire, the flames were controlled in such a manner that the fire would rise after a big move was pulled off and the object of the match was to set your opponent alight. You can only imagine how hot it must have been inside and immediately around that ring. It must have been a hard match to pull off, but Kane and The Undertaker had a good, interesting match here, and one that I feel was better than their WrestleMania encounter. I mentioned earlier that the WrestleMania pay-per-view was already sold thanks to Steve Austin and Mike Tyson, but WrestleMania 14 could have been so much more had the Inferno match took place then instead of one month later. Anyway, Kane's arm got satellite and Undertaker won the match. I remember thinking that the finish was cheap, Kane's arm was covered up and all that, but now that I think about it, I'm not sure I want to see someone's face getting burned off on pay-per-view. The next night on Raw, The Undertaker wrestled Barry Windham and it was a squash match. It was over in around a minute and you can't help but think that Undertaker vs a Barry Windham still in his prime would have been such a huge deal at one point, but it is what it is. After the match, The Undertaker spoke to Kane, saying the Inferno match wasn't the end, it was only the beginning. 
Undertaker called out his little brother for a fight, prompting the Big Red Machine and Paul Bearer to arrive on the stage. Paul said he wanted a truce, the fighting now had to stop between Kane and the dead man, and Paul then went on to reveal that Kane was actually his son. Jerry Lawler, after the segment, was all giddy because this man Paul Bearer slept with The Undertaker's mother, and yeah, what more can you say here? On the May 4th episode of Raw, Paul Bearer was scheduled for an interview backstage with Jerry Lawler, but the cameras were left rolling and we got an opportunity to eavesdrop on a conversation between Lawler and Paul Bearer. Jerry asked Paul if he nailed his word, not mine, nailed The Undertaker's mother. Paul Bear said he did indeed on the kitchen floor. Paul said he was interrupted during the deed by Undertaker's little feet coming down the stairs, saying it was a good thing that he didn't walk in and see the side of his mother's legs in the air, one foot in New York and one foot in LA, as Paul Bearer put it. Afterwards, Jerry Lawler apologised that this conversation had just made the air. Later in the evening, Kane had a match with Goldust and The Undertaker stormed to the ring to attack Paul Bear and Kane. Things got ridiculous on the May 18th episode of Raw when Paul Bear and Kane paid a visit to the local medical facility to get a DNA test completed. Paul wanted to prove to the world that Kane was indeed his son. This DNA testing procedure went a step further by having a doctor appear live on Raw to reveal the results. The doctor told us that Paul Bearer was Kane's father, without a doubt. Paul Bearer and Kane came to the ring. Paul had some choice words for the Taker's mother, prompting the dead man to hit the ring and launch an attack. Undertaker and Kane would get involved in the WWF title picture afterwards. Undertaker came down to ringside during the Steve Austin vs Dude Love title match at Over the Edge 1998 and we all thought he was there to ensure the match was called fairly after Taker himself had a run in with Vince McMahon on Raw. Undertaker was there to make sure Austin didn't get screwed over, but after the match he looked at Steve Austin in a not so friendly manner, giving the impression here that he was coming after Stone Cold and he was coming after the WWF Championship. The next night on Raw, The Undertaker was uncharacteristically dressed in sweats and he began a sort of work shoot promo targeted at Vince McMahon. Undertaker said that his title reigns within the WWF were always cut short because Vince McMahon didn't think The Undertaker should be the face of his company. Taker said he stayed loyal when everyone else left for more money and he got repaid by Vince McMahon telling Paul Bear to go on live TV and talk about Taker's family for TV ratings. Taker said that while he was working against Kane, Stone Cold rose to the top and secured the WWF Championship. And now the Taker wants a shot at the gold. The Undertaker said that it was time to take what was rightfully his. Vince McMahon came out and said that The Undertaker was both loyal and a man of honour, but Vince wanted to know what had The Undertaker done for Vince McMahon lately. After taking jabs at The Undertaker's mother, Vince said that Undertaker will become the number one contender if he can defeat his opponent on that evening, his brother Kane. During the match, Mick Foley ran to the ring and applied the mandible claw on The Undertaker, which ultimately led to The Undertaker taking the loss. Kane became the number one contender, he would face Steve Austin at the King of the Ring 1998. Mankind and The Undertaker though would have their own match, a Hell in a Cell match at the King of the Ring pay-per-view. History would be made on this very night. What can I say about the 1998 King of the Ring Undertaker vs Mankind match that hasn't been said already? I guess the best thing I can do here is give my recollections of watching this live when it went down. It was truly a memorable match. Just so I'm not contradicting myself here, I've said in previous videos that I prefer the HBK vs Taker Cell match at Bad Blood 1997. I liked how the cell itself became a living, breathing character within that match, and how Shawn Michaels displayed fear being locked inside. He had to either fight or get ripped apart inside the steel structure. So when King of the Ring 1998 came around, I couldn't help thinking that this Hell in a Cell here wouldn't be anywhere near as good as Michaels vs Undertaker. 
What Mankind and The Undertaker done right though, was they completely altered the story of the match. This one did not play out like bad blood at all, and it was the absolute right decision. That being said, what these two guys ended up doing would be the talk among my friends for weeks upon weeks. Undertaker and Mankind's Hell in a Cell match here was dangerous, it was shocking, it was reckless, and it was everything that was truly awesome about this time in wrestling. Sure, many modern fans will complain about the dangers of such a match and how this isn't real wrestling, and you'll get your hypocrites who complain about hardcore wrestling but put this match on a pedestal, but this Hell in a Cell showdown is a landmark match in WWE history, and I remember actually being a little dismissive of the match beforehand because, in my mind, it was never going to be as good as Bad Blood. Boy, was I in for a shock. I'm not going to go over the match move for move because it's been done countless times. Even the commentators get asked about the match constantly and with good reason too may I add. But I can't bring up the match and not talk about these insanely scary falls during the match. The match started off on top of the cage and within minutes, Mankind was thrown off the top of the cell and he went through the announce table. I was speechless during this moment when I watched it live, and putting myself back when I saw this in 1998, it was just so unexpected too. I think that's what was more shocking, there was no build up to the fall, Taker just grabbed Foley and threw him off like he was nothing. Vince McMahon broke character by coming to ringside to see if Foley was okay, Terry Funk came out to see if Foley was okay, it really did feel like a scary moment. This spot though was planned. The next fall, the one where Foley went through the cage roof and hit extremely hard on the ring mat, that was not planned, and Foley was legitimately knocked out after the fall. It was at this point I was just totally blown away by what I was saying. It was Mick Foley putting himself through agony, attempting to entertain fans while having no care at all about his own well-being. A chair also fell here with Mick Foley that smacked Mick in the face, knocking one of Foley's teeth up into his nose, and when Mick tried to get to his feet, a simple working punch from The Undertaker made his knees buckle and he again crumbled to the mat, knocked out once again. Undertaker won the match and I'm not sure what else I can say here, but simply, you need to see this match from start to end if you haven't already. Seeing the clips does not tell the story, there's more insanity here with thumbtacks, steel chairs, dangerous offense all around, and if you haven't seen this match from bell to bell for whatever reason, you're in for a real roller coaster ride. Keep in mind too that Undertaker vs Mankind at the 1998 King of the Ring was not the main event. Kane got his title shot against Steve Austin at this same show and Kane won the WWF Championship in a first blood match against the Texas Rattlesnake. During the match, The Undertaker accidentally hit Steve Austin with a steel chair, causing Austin to bleed and therefore, Kane became the new WWF Champion. Taker even tried to pour gasoline and set the referee on fire here. Taker was definitely showing a more sinister side to his character at the 1998 King of the Ring. The next night on Raw, The Undertaker said he did what he had to do at the King of the Ring when he interfered in the title match. Vince McMahon came out and said The Undertaker helped Kane because Taker knew he could beat Kane, but he also knew that he couldn't beat Stone Cold Steve Austin, implicating here that The Undertaker was looking for an easy path to the WWF Championship. During a WWF title rematch later that evening between Kane and Steve Austin, Undertaker came to the ring against Vince McMahon's orders, and the dead man stood by as Steve Austin defeated Kane to recapture the WWF title. After the match, Steve Austin delivered a stone cold stunner to The Undertaker, and Raw went off the air with both The Undertaker and Kane standing in the ring, staring at the WWF Champion. The July 13th episode of Raw saw Kane and Mankind get a tag team title opportunity against the New Age Outlaws, and Kane and Mankind won the match. Due to interference during the match however, DX managed to talk Vince McMahon into ordering a rematch later in the evening. 
Steve Austin and The Undertaker were ringside enforcers for the rematch, and when the referee got took out, both Austin and Undertaker interrupted each other from counting Kane and Road Dogg's shoulders to the mat respectively. In the end, Kane and Mankind remained tag champions, and the big ongoing tease here was that The Undertaker and Kane were now on the same page. The following week, Vince McMahon called The Undertaker to the ring and it was announced that Steve Austin and The Undertaker would have to coexist when they faced Mankind and Kane at Fully Loaded for the tag team titles. This match was pretty fun, we didn't know if Undertaker would attack Kane and the whole match evolved around this will he won't he narrative, but Undertaker did indeed lay in the offence to his little brother, securing the tag titles here for both Steve Austin and himself, even though Taker left the ring with both belts. Kane and Mankind won the tag team titles back on the August 10th episode of Raw during an excellent 14 tag match. Undertaker took the pinfall loss to Kane, but it wasn't all bad news for the dead man, as Taker was named the number one contender for Steve Austin's WWF Championship. Their match would happen at SummerSlam 1998. Immediately after dropping the tag titles though, Steve Austin looked at The Undertaker as if something wasn't right. Undertaker looked back at Austin without much emotion. On the August 17th 1998 episode of Raw, Stone Cold Steve Austin came to the ring for a confrontation with The Undertaker, but underneath the trench coat, Stone Cold instead found Kane dressed up as his brother, another excellent moment here that I thought was done pretty well. Again, this fueled more speculation about Kane and The Undertaker working together, and if this wasn't enough, when Steve Austin threw Kane into a hearse that was in the arena, it was only The Undertaker who was behind the steering wheel, much to Austin's surprise. Raw went off the air with The Undertaker slowly driving the hearse away with his brother inside. We wouldn't need to guess anymore. The very next episode of Raw, the SummerSlam Go Home Show, opened up with The Undertaker walking side by side with Kane. This is quite historic too, the first time the Brothers of Destruction walked to the ring together as a team. Vince McMahon came to the ring with a big smile on his face, and when he stood in front of Kane and The Undertaker, Vince said that the brothers together were the most destructive force in the WWF, and there's no doubt that The Undertaker will now win the championship at SummerSlam, implying that Kane can help Taker defeat Steve Austin. Vince went on to say that The Undertaker will need Vince McMahon during his upcoming championship reign, and Vince wanted to know if The Undertaker was his friend or if The Undertaker was his foe. Paul Bearer then came out, trying to guilt trip Kane because of this new alliance the Big Red Machine now had with the Taker. Paul Bearer instructed Kane to destroy the Undertaker, but Kane turned his back, allowing the Undertaker to attack Bearer. Later in the evening, Undertaker answered Vince McMahon's question, he was still his foe, and Raw went off the air with the Undertaker and Kane brawling with Steve Austin. SummerSlam 1998's main event featuring Steve Austin vs The Undertaker, again, should have been much better than what it was, but there's a reason for this being a little average. Steve Austin was legitimately knocked out in the early moments of the match, and this led to some awkward exchanges along with Austin's timing being a little off. Steve Austin said himself after he got knocked out, he asked referee Yard Hebner where he was, he really didn't know what happened, and he didn't have his bearings for a moment, and Earl Hebner told him he was in Madison Square Garden. Imagine that for a moment, the sudden realisation that you're in the world's most famous arena, in the main event of a pay per view, and you didn't even know how you ended up there for a brief moment anyway. Still, all things considered, the match was passable, but even Austin says today that he knew he was capable of much more, he kinda beats himself up over it. Austin won the match, and Taker teased a heel turn after the match, but he ended up handing the championship title to Steve Austin and walking away with Kane at his side. Undertaker got another opportunity against Austin at Breakdown In Your House the following month, but this match also involved Kane, a triple threat match here where Kane and The Undertaker were not allowed to pin each other. Both Kane and Undertaker pinned Austin at the same time, meaning there was no clear WWF champion when the show went off the air. The title was taken away by Vince McMahon, we didn't know who the champion was, and we wouldn't have a new WWF champion for quite some time after this. 
Undertaker was ordered to wrestle Kane at Judgment Day 1998 in October with Steve Austin as the special referee. This match was for the WWF Championship and this match again ended with no clear winner thanks to Steve Austin declaring himself as the winner. We need to go back to Judgment Day to get a full picture here. The Undertaker took on Kane for the vacant WWF Championship with Stone Cold Steve Austin acting as the referee. We already know that the match ended with no clear outcome thanks to Steve Austin declaring himself as the winner, but something else happened during this match that is very noteworthy. In the closing moments of the match, Paul Bearer came to ringside holding a chair. He got in the ring and it looked like he was going to hit The Undertaker, but Paul Bearer would hit his son Kane while Kane's back was turned. Paul Bearer then invited The Undertaker to pin Kane, but Steve Austin wouldn't count the pin attempt. The match ended then with Austin counting to three while both men were laid out on the mat, so we would need to tune into Raw the very next night to see what was going on. Stone Cold Steve Austin was also fired by Vince McMahon on this night, the very first time McMahon said his infamous you're fired catchphrase, and the WWF Championship still didn't have a rightful owner. The next night on Raw saw Steve Austin take Vince McMahon hostage in one of the more memorable episodes, but before all this happened, Vince McMahon kicked the show off with an announcement. Vince said that because of Steve Austin, the WWF has no champion and therefore, the upcoming Survivor Series pay-per-view will host a 16-man tournament to crown a new champion. Later in the show, The Undertaker had an interview segment and walking side by side with the dead man was Paul Bearer once again. Taker got in the ring and said a reconciliation had been made and The Undertaker said that Paul Bearer has come home to lead the dead man's Ministry of Darkness. Undertaker said that he's sure that many people out there couldn't understand why he would realign himself with such a despicable, evil, maniacal individual, but Undertaker explained that Paul Bearer allowed him to clear his head and refocus on what he was in the WWF for. Taker said this is a new era and the Ministry of Darkness will unleash a plague on the World Wrestling Federation. Paul Bearer took the mic and explained that he used Kane like a little pet and because Kane could never see and understand the true darkness, Paul Bearer had no further use for the big red machine. Undertaker then dropped a huge announcement when he said it was he himself that caused Kane to get burned in the fire all those years ago at the funeral home, saying he did it because Kane was weak and only the strong survive. Kane came out to the entranceway pushing a casket going on to challenge Undertaker to a casket match later in the evening and telling the dead man that he will rest in peace. The casket match ended with no winner, Undertaker and Paul Bearer just walked away to the backstage area during the bout. It was revealed the next week that Stone Cold Steve Austin had been rehired thanks to Shane McMahon, leading to Shane giving one of the absolute best promos of his career here, with Shane saying he's tired of seeing superstars come and go because of his father's ego. We'll talk about Shane in another video though, all you need to know is Steve Austin was back and later that evening he had a match with Ken Shamrock. Vince McMahon's stooges tried to make life difficult for Stone Cold, but Mick Foley evened the odds by putting Shamrock in the mandible claw. Steve Austin got in the ring, he smacked Shamrock with a steel chair and Stone Cold won the match. Austin delivered stunners to Patterson, Briscoe and Sergeant Slaughter and the show went off the air. The next week, Vince McMahon punished the stooges by locking them inside a steel cage with the big boss man. The boss man destroyed Briscoe, Patterson and Slaughter, but the beating stopped after Stone Cold Steve Austin and eventually Shane McMahon hit the ring. When Austin was left in the cage on his own, The Undertaker and Paul Bearer came down the ramp. Taker locked himself inside the cage with Austin and a fight broke out between the Phenom and the Texas Rattlesnake. When Undertaker got the upper hand, Kane showed up and he set the cage on fire with his pyro. The show went off the air with all three men brawling in the flaming steel cage. And yes, I totally missed this in my big blue steel cage video, apologies for that. 
Undertaker and Kane met at the Survivor Series Deadly Game Tournament, with both men getting buys into the quarterfinals. Undertaker got the win here thanks to Paul Bearer, so the dead man went to the semi-finals to square off with The Rock. Because Kane came to the ring and chokeslammed The Rock, The Undertaker got disqualified and eliminated from the tournament. Taker and Kane fought through the audience, and The Rock went on to win the tournament and the WWF Championship when he aligned himself with Vince McMahon. The Rock became the corporate champion, as Vince was now adding more wrestlers to his very own faction, known as the Corporation. So The Undertaker was then booked into a Buried Alive match with Steve Austin, and this would occur at rock bottom in your house. On the November 16th episode of Raw, Undertaker hit Steve Austin with a shovel which caused Stone Cold some problems the following week. In storyline, Steve Austin had blacked out during a live event. The 23rd of November episode of WWF Raw then showed us Steve Austin getting treated at a hospital, and later in the show, The Undertaker and Paul Bearer infiltrated the hospital, leading to Austin getting knocked out and brought to a nearby open grave. Undertaker decided not to bury Stone Cold, but instead, he would embalm Austin alive. Taker, Austin and Bearer then went to the funeral home, and The Undertaker showed the first sides of his more satanic character when he began speaking in tongues. Anyway, Kane showed up to stop the festivities, the feed was interrupted, and we went back to the arena. The following week, Steve Austin was looking for The Undertaker backstage, and he bumped into this woman and asked her if she had seen The Undertaker, to which she replied no. This young lady here is Stephanie McMahon, and she'd be used in this storyline as time went on. Anyway, Stone Cold continued his search for the dead man, but he ended up getting locked in a freezer room by Paul Bearer and the Taker. Undertaker went to the ring and said that his plague in the WWF was growing stronger and stronger. His Ministry of Darkness also grows stronger, but Steve Austin and Kane are getting in his way. Taker said he will take care of Austin at rock bottom, and Kane would be dealt with later on this evening. Kane came to the ring, the two began brawling, and a bunch of men in white coats came to the ring holding a straitjacket, threatening to take Kane away here to what we assume would be some sort of mental asylum. Kane escaped as Paul Bearer laughed on the rampway. Undertaker and Bearer found Kane later on, and Undertaker instructed Paul Bearer to go get the white coats while Taker put Kane in a body bag. With Paul Bearer gone, Steve Austin showed up and took out the Undertaker. Paul Bearer returned with the white coats and took the body bag away. Paul checked to see if Kane was still in there, and later we saw Paul Bearer wave bye bye as the body bag was taken away. What Paul didn't know though was that he just waved goodbye to The Undertaker. Taker was in the body bag, not Kane, and now Austin and the Big Red Machine were coming after Paul Bearer. Austin and Kane dragged Paul Bearer to the ring later in the evening to cut a promo, and then they took Paul outside and put him in the sewers of Baltimore. A great episode of Raw here, this one was loads of fun to go back and watch. The next week though, on the December 7th 1998 edition of Raw, we would get treated to one of The Undertaker's most well remembered moments, not just of this heel run, but of all time. The Undertaker took part in a star studded tag team main event, teaming up with The Rock to face Stone Cold Steve Austin and Mankind, but before this match took place, Steve Austin had an in ring promo to kick off the second hour of Raw. The Undertaker's voice interrupted Stone Cold, the Prince of Darkness said that Steve Austin will be sacrificed to the Ministry of Darkness, and a giant Undertaker symbol was set alight on the entranceway. Later on, during the tag main event, The Undertaker carried Austin up the rampway where Taker's druids were waiting to put Austin on the Undertaker symbol. Austin was strapped up, and the symbol began rising, hanging over The Undertaker and giving us this incredible visual right here. Truly unforgettable. So we arrive at rock bottom, Undertaker vs Steve Austin in a buried alive match. The WWF had done a fantastic job in building this one up and the match itself was good. I feel it was much better than their SummerSlam 1998 encounter, having a clear babyface and a clear heel here made things more enjoyable when it came to Austin vs Taker. And also, Austin didn't get knocked out during this match so that obviously helps. 
While Taker had been a heel during his early days in the WWF, this Undertaker was way, way different. The Prince of Darkness was now established as a more aggressive and more evil version of the Undertaker gimmick, and it worked incredibly well. However, things were only really beginning for this new demonic Undertaker. Austin and Taker battled all around the arena here, and towards the end of the match, an explosion occurred from inside the grave. Kane appeared and he launched an attack on The Undertaker. Undertaker got distracted when Steve Austin brought a digger to the gravesite, and it seemed like the driver had some real problems trying to operate the machinery that would help bury The Undertaker alive. You need to watch this back, you can hear Stone Cold getting frustrated with the whole ordeal, and referee Earl Hebner just ended up raising Stone Cold's hand in victory, and the show went off the air. After the Buried Alive match, we would not see The Undertaker for a few weeks. Elsewhere on the World Wrestling Federation cards, Ron Simmons and Bradshaw had formed The Acolytes, a tag team that was managed by The Jackal, better known as Don Callis. The Jackal had been on commentary talking about being a puppet master that controls everything from the shadows, and so it's widely believed that the Jackal would be revealed as the higher power behind The Undertaker's Ministry of Darkness. We would never find out though, Don Callis left the WWF at the end of 1998. So on the December 28th 1998 episode of Raw, we saw Dennis Knight backstage talking to Axe Pac and Dennis told Axe Pac he was at Raw because he said to be here, not revealing who he was. Dennis had worked in the WWF previously as Phineas Godwin and backstage he was also good friends with The Undertaker. Anyway, later in the evening, Dennis was attacked and abducted by the Acolytes. No reason at all was given for Bradshaw and Farouk's actions here. On the January 11th, 1999 edition of Raw, Dennis Knight was placed on an altar with the Acolytes beside him. The Undertaker's music played and the Prince of Darkness returned here alongside Paul Bearer. Undertaker spoke to the audience, saying people thought that burying him alive would be the end of The Undertaker, but instead, people had now sent The Undertaker back to his place of origin. Taker said he had risen from the grave to slay the ones he once saved, and the reckoning was now upon us. Undertaker said that he will share his power of darkness with a chosen few, confirming here that the men sharing the stage with him were now part of the new Ministry of Darkness stable. Taker then approached Dennis Knight, speaking in tongues as he took a knife from Paul Bearer. Undertaker made a cut, and he renamed Dennis Knight as Midian. After carving the Undertaker symbol onto Midian, Undertaker told us all that we are going to learn why we are afraid of the dark as the Undertaker's symbol went up in flames. So yeah, this was the official reveal of the Ministry stable, and Undertaker had now gone 100% demonic. This sort of thing was sure to raise a few complaints from the more good living folk among us. The segment worked wonders for WWF audiences however as the pop was insane the next week for The Undertaker. Even though he was a heel here, the whole Ministry of Darkness thing had really caught on in a huge way. With Bradshaw, Farouk, Paul Bearer and the delirious Midian beside him, The Undertaker sat on the stage and said that the sacrifices aren't over, someone would join the ministry that Sunday at the 1999 Royal Rumble. During the Rumble match itself then, Mabel came out as the 11th entrant. The lights went out, The Undertaker's theme music played in the arena, and when the lights came back on, we saw the Acolytes and Midian attacking Mabel. Undertaker came out and the Taker's gaze seemed to play with Mabel's mind, almost hypnotizing him. The remaining members of the Ministry then continued their attack, all men disappeared back through the curtain and the Royal Rumble match continued. We later saw Mabel getting loaded into a hearse and the next night Mabel was reintroduced as Viscera. So this was the core ministry team here, the Acolytes, Midian, Mabel, Paul Bearer and The Undertaker. The faction was being used here to give maybe lesser stars something to sink their teeth into with The Undertaker giving these guys credibility through association. Taker, Midian and Viscera were scheduled to take on The Brood on the February 1st 1999 edition of Raw but Taker decided to sit it out and let his minions do his dirty work. The match ended when the Acolytes came down to help Midian and Viscera destroy the Brood and strangely, the Brood pushed WWF officials away when they tried to help them. 
After Gangrel, Edge and Christian were annihilated by the Ministry of Darkness, The Undertaker came to the ring to get a better view of the carnage. Later in the evening, the Acolytes defeated Al Snow in the Road Dog, and after the match, the Ministry and the Druids came to the ring. The Undertaker stood at the entranceway and he ordered the Druids to remove their hoods, and it was revealed that Edge, Gangrel and Christian, the Brood, were now also members of the Ministry of Darkness. This explained why the Brood pushed WWF officials away during the brawl with the Ministry. Their beating in the ring was an initiation. Our next pay-per-view was the St. Valentine's Day Massacre show on February 14th, 1999, and The Undertaker had a meeting backstage with the Ministry of Darkness here. Undertaker said that Midian would take the boss man's soul during his scheduled match, and The Taker also said that the power from beyond had spoken to him, saying that the Ministry's purpose in life begins on that very night. Bossman ended up defeating Midian, but after the match, the Ministry surrounded the ring, leading to Viscera splashing the Bossman multiple times, and the Bossman getting carried away by the Ministry of Darkness. Fans assumed here that this meant the Bossman would now be added to the Ministry, but no. The Ministry taking out the Corporation's Bossman meant the Ministry now had a new enemy, Vince McMahon himself. Michael Cole said on commentary the next night that the Bossman managed to escape. The entire ministry came out then on the February 15th edition of Raw as The Undertaker had an announcement to make. The ministry's mission was to now take over the entire World Wrestling Federation. Undertaker said that one by one, everyone in the WWF would fall to the ministry, and the beating the boss man took was proof that there's nothing Vince McMahon can do about the upcoming destruction of the WWF. Undertaker then said that each soul that the Ministry takes, they take in the name of the Higher Power, a power that is even greater than himself, and through this greater power, the Undertaker will own the World Wrestling Federation. Taker also said that the Ministry and the Higher Power own the key to Vince McMahon's heart and soul, but a little more on that later. So the feud had been set up, the Ministry versus the Corporation, a bit of an odd setup here as both factions were heels but still it didn't matter, this was entertaining. Things would get more and more interesting though as the weeks went on. Corporation members Ken Shamrock, Test and the Boss Man took on Midian and the Acolytes later in the night. The match got interrupted by The Undertaker coming to the stage, holding on to an abducted Shane McMahon. Shane played the part well here, he was scared, he was shaking, he thought The Undertaker was going to sacrifice him, but instead, The Undertaker gave Shane a letter along with orders to give the letter to Vince. Vince ended up booking the second ever Inferno match in WWF history for the following week's Raw. Undertaker vs Kane would wrestle again in a ring surrounded by flames. I should also note that Kane had joined the corporation after Vince McMahon promised him that his membership also included the promise of never having to go to a mental asylum. I thought the first Inferno match was better here, and I think that comes down to seeing the match for the very first time and the intrigue that comes with that. And along with this, this second Inferno match here had a lot of other stuff going on around ringside to distract viewers, but still, it was good to see The Undertaker wrestle again on TV. He hadn't had a proper televised match since Rock Bottom back in December of 1998, at least one where he got in the ring anyway. A few things happened before the Inferno match though. Firstly, the Brood were disciplined by the other Ministry members after Gangrel and Edge lost a tag team match against the Public Enemy, and The Undertaker delivered a backstage promo where he again spoke about the higher power and owning the key to Vince's heart and soul. During the Inferno match, Vince McMahon revealed on commentary that the letter Shane McMahon delivered to him was of a very personal nature and not something he wanted discussed on TV. But things would get more cryptic when Paul Bearer delivered a box to McMahon at the commentary table. Vince opened the box, it contained a teddy bear, and the sight of the teddy seemed to upset Vince McMahon, causing him to leave the commentary table as the Inferno match continued. Anyway, Kane's foot was set on fire this time, and after the match, Undertaker grabbed the teddy bear from a distraught Vince McMahon, setting it alight and bringing the owner of the WWF to his knees. The next week on Raw, Undertaker had a match with Mankind and it was also announced that the Phenom would face the boss man at WrestleMania inside Hell in a Cell. During the Mankind match, The Undertaker went after Vince McMahon which gave the boss man a chance to launch a sneak attack.
The March 8th episode of Raw saw Undertaker once again putting someone up on the giant Undertaker symbol, although this one isn't remembered as well as the Steve Austin segment. This time, Undertaker's WrestleMania opponent, the big boss man, done the honours. However, boss man was able to break free from the symbol. This led to the corporation running out to help the boss man and also the police got involved. The cops wanted to arrest The Undertaker and after Taker instructed Paul Bearer to make a phone call, The Undertaker put his hands out and allowed the police to arrest him. Vince McMahon gloated as The Undertaker was put into a police car backstage, but it looked like The Undertaker had a few plans up his sleeve here. The following week's Raw then, Shane McMahon and Vince McMahon walked back up the entranceway after Shane's match with the Stooges. A video on the Titantron appeared showing the Ministry of Darkness live at Vince McMahon's home. Vince went backstage and he attempted to call police but they thought it was a publicity stunt. When we got back from commercial, The Undertaker phoned Vince McMahon saying it's nearly 10 o'clock and does Vince McMahon know where his family is? Later in the evening, we saw the Undertaker symbol burning outside Vince's house and the Taker said that he is waiting for her to come home. Triple H, meanwhile, was having some problems with Kane and Hunter called the Big Red Machine out towards the end of the show. Kane came out to fight with Triple H and during the brawl, Vince McMahon came to ringside and he pleaded with Kane to talk with his older brother. Kane then removed his mask, and this wasn't Kane, this was The Undertaker. Undertaker grabbed Vince McMahon, the lights went out, and when the lights came back on, Vince was left standing in the ring, looking seriously shook up. Let's skip ahead then to WrestleMania 15, and yeah, not one of The Undertaker's better WrestleMania matches here. It was cool at the time to see a Hell in a Cell match at WrestleMania, and there were enough elements here to make this memorable, but I think it comes down to Undertaker's opponent here, the big boss man, not being as high on the cards as what he once was. Boss man could still go here, don't get me wrong, but for a Hell in a Cell match at WrestleMania in 1999, I think there may have been better choices to face Undertaker here. Add in the fact that expectations were ridiculously high thanks to the Mankind vs Undertaker Cell match from the year prior, and yeah, this was maybe doomed before it even started. I'll say this though, a lot of people comment on these Taker videos about the Phenom's attires and his different looks over the years. His entrance in ring attire at WrestleMania 15 is definitely one of my favourites. Anyway, Undertaker gets the win with the Tombstone in a pretty unremarkable match. People remember the ending though, the Brood appeared from the rafters and they dropped a noose into the ring. Undertaker grabbed it, he put it around Bossman's neck, and Paul Bearer made the cell rise. And yeah, the boss man was left hanging from the hell in a cell structure at WrestleMania. Steve Austin won the WWF Championship at WrestleMania 15 and the next night on Raw, Austin said he would relinquish the belt. Stone Cold handed the belt to Vince McMahon, but afterwards, Austin revealed he wasn't giving up the title, just the title belt. Stone Cold wanted his custom made smoking skull belt back from Vince McMahon, which was apparently at Vince's home. Later on, Stephanie McMahon, Vince's daughter, was backstage with Vince and Shane and Vince told Stephanie to ring home and get the championship belt back to the arena. Back in the ring, the ministry called out Vince threatening to hurt Sable if he didn't hurry up. When Vince came out, he quickly realised that Stephanie could be in trouble backstage. Vince just ran back to his room and Stephanie had vanished. Ken Shamrock managed to find her a little later on after persuading Brood member Christian to reveal her location and Stephanie was returned to Vince McMahon. The smoking skull belt was delivered, Vince left the arena with Stephanie, but The Rock and Shane McMahon would end up holding on to the smoking skull belt for a little while longer. Shane was defying Vince's orders here when Vince told Shane just to give it to Steve Austin. The next week, Undertaker promised to capture Stephanie once again, only this time, the Undertaker would sacrifice Stephanie. For revealing Stephanie's whereabouts the week before, Christian was punished by The Undertaker and the rest of the Ministry a little later on, and Ken Shamrock was also thrown into a car and abducted by the Ministry. To end the show, Undertaker didn't sacrifice Stephanie, but instead, the Ministry sacrificed Ryan Shamrock. Undertaker sent the message here, though he wasn't about to give up serving his higher power just yet. The next week, 
Shane McMahon took charge of what he called the new corporation as it seemed Vince was too busy protecting Stephanie. Ken Shamrock questioned Shane about where the corporation was when he was abducted and where was the corporation when his sister got sacrificed the week prior, but Shane promised to give Ken an answer later on. Shane also fired Jerry Briscoe and Pat Patterson during this segment, getting out with the old and in with the new, and to finally solidify himself as the leader of the corporation, he slapped Vince in the face while saying Vince McMahon had his priorities all out of order. Later in the evening, Ken Shamrock was about to get sacrificed, but Undertaker attacked Christian before the deed could be done. The Undertaker ordered Gangrel and Edge to sacrifice Christian also, but the Brood members refused and a fight broke out within the Ministry of Darkness. The Undertaker disappeared as the fight went on, and the Brood had now officially left the Ministry. I think this was for the best. The Brood were already unique enough and had gotten pretty popular without the Ministry. Still, they were a nice addition, but I also think they could just do fine on their own. To end the show, Ken Shamrock called out The Undertaker and this led to the Ministry laying a beating into the world's most dangerous man. We thought Triple H and Boss Man were about to save Shamrock, but instead, the corporation members continued beating up Shamrock as Shane McMahon looked on with a smile. The April 19th edition of Raw then, The Undertaker orders the Acolytes to destroy the Brood in their tag match. Ken Shamrock interfered in the match, so the Acolytes were unable to complete their mission. Undertaker was annoyed backstage, leading to Viscera and Taker beating up Farouk and Bradshaw after the match. Later on, Midian spooked Vince and Stephanie while the McMahons were conducting a sit-down interview, leading to an all-out assault by Vince McMahon. At the Backlash pay-per-view then later that week, The Undertaker told the Ministry that they must now prepare for the arrival of the Higher Power. Before the main event match that pitted The Rock against Steve Austin, Vince McMahon had Stephanie wait in a limousine until the end of the pay-per-view. After the main event, the cameras went back to the limo, and because the Ministry of Darkness just appeared, the security guys ordered the limousine to drive away. We got a view from inside Stephanie's ride. The Undertaker was revealed as the driver. The Ministry of Darkness had finally kidnapped Stephanie McMahon. Where to, Stephanie? <laughs> the next night, the Ministry got ready to sacrifice Stephanie. Undertaker had requested that Vince McMahon hand over the paperwork that would ultimately give the dead man complete control of the World Wrestling Federation, but when Vince tried to get the papers delivered, The Undertaker was not there. And so, the sacrifice was scheduled to happen during the last segment of Raw. When Stephanie got brought into the ring, it was revealed that she would not get sacrificed after all, but instead, she was about to enter an unholy union with The Undertaker when the two got wed. Ken Shamrock tried to stop the marriage, Big Show tried to stop the marriage, but it was Stone Cold Steve Austin who ran in and put an end to the ceremony. The commentator said Austin isn't helping Stephanie for Vince McMahon, but Austin was saving Stephanie as it was the right thing to do. Three days after this episode of Raw, WWF Smackdown was put on TV for the very first time. This was the pilot episode, meaning this broadcast was used to test the waters in terms of attracting viewers and possible advertisers. It's an interesting show for sure, but it's also mandatory viewing for those wanting to get the full story on the corporate ministry. The team was actually formed on this very night. The show kicked off with Vince and Stephanie coming down to the ring, being escorted by a security team here to ensure no kidnappings would happen on this night. Vince and Stephanie got in the ring, the audience began chanting some mean things at Vinnie Mac, but Vince was determined to try and swing the audience here. He admitted to making mistakes, but he also said he wanted to change. Vince said that in the past, he has sometimes conducted business at the expense of his family and he wants to turn a page and thank people who have helped him and helped his family. Vince thanked Ken Shamrock, The Big Show and Stone Cold Steve Austin for stepping up against the Ministry of Darkness. Stephanie took the mic and talked about how she felt violated by The Undertaker, how she felt stripped of her dignity and the audience cheered in approval. If the creative team were expecting fans to sympathise with Stephanie and Vince, well, the creative team got it wrong here. 
Anyway, Shane McMahon and the corporation came to the ring. Shane asked what happened to the most ruthless business tycoon in the world and why was Vince out here thanking Stone Cold Steve Austin after everything they had been through. Shane told Vince and Stephanie to get out of the ring and to avoid conflict with the corporation, Vince and Stephanie left the arena. Shane went on to say that the two men currently on the corporation's hit list were Stone Cold Steve Austin and The Rock, and these two men, Stone Cold and The Rock, would team up in the main event of the evening. Shane asked for volunteers to face The Rock and Austin in a tag team match. Triple H put his hand up and Shane said Triple H is in the match. Shane then asked for one more volunteer and when he asked if there were any takers, the lights in the arena went out. The Undertaker's theme music played, Taker appeared on the Titantron and he had a message for Steve Austin. Undertaker said that Stone Cold ruined a special ceremony on Raw. He stopped Stephanie McMahon from becoming the Undertaker's bride and servant. The dead man said that he would be Austin's judge, jury and executioner in the main event of the first ever Smackdown. So we had an odd coupling here of the corporation's Triple H and the ministry's Undertaker taking on another odd coupling, Steve Austin and The Rock. A bit later in the broadcast, The Rock and Stone Cold Steve Austin came out for an in-ring promo. It was evident that The Rock and Austin were going to have difficulties getting along in their tag team match judging by the comments that they had for each other, so when Shane McMahon walked out to interrupt the promo, he made sure to mention how great it was that The Rock and Austin couldn't get along. Shane said his plans have been getting bigger and better, and at that very moment, the lights again in the arena went out, the Undertaker's music played, and the Prince of Darkness stood beside Shane McMahon. Shane asked The Rock and Stone Cold if this was beginning to make sense, and just to ensure that Austin and Rock got the message, the rest of the corporation and the rest of the Ministry of Darkness came out and stood beside Shane and The Undertaker. Jim Cornette, on commentary, said that this looks like the corporate merger from hell, and indeed it was. Shane introduced us to the corporate ministry, and Shane McMahon told Austin and The Rock that they better rethink their strategy. So this was it, the birth of the corporate ministry, the two biggest heel factions in the World Wrestling Federation at the time joining forces. Before the main event match on SmackDown, we saw Shane giving the corporate ministry a pep talk. It seemed like Shane was going to be the leader here. Everyone was gathered around listening to him talk about how the group was created by him and how the team would be dominant. The tag team match then felt like a pay-per-view main event. This was a great, fast-paced bout that helped set the tone for SmackDown. This wasn't going to be a secondary B-show. SmackDown would feature the WWF's best each and every week. Anyway, the match broke down into a brawl towards the closing moments. The corporate ministry ran down to give Austin and Rock a DQ win, and afterwards, Test, Big Show and Ken Shamrock hit the ring to help Austin and The Rock. All three of these men were once part of the corporation but had either left or got ejected from the stable. Shane McMahon felt this was a good opportunity to interfere with a steel chair, but Vince McMahon came to the ring to stop his son. Shane managed to pass the chair to The Undertaker and Vince got in the ring and took a sick chair shot from the dead man. I mean, this one looked pretty painful. This gave Stone Cold Steve Austin an opportunity to hit stunners on both The Undertaker and Shane McMahon and the show went off the air. The May 3rd episode of Raw then was totally dominated by the Corporate Ministry storyline. Just so you know where we are at this point then, the Corporate Ministry's main enemies were Vince McMahon, Stone Cold and The Rock. Shane McMahon had merged the Corporation and the Ministry to become the most dominant faction in the World Wrestling Federation, even though The Undertaker had been stalking Shane's sister and making life difficult for Shane's father. It was soon revealed too that Shane had orchestrated the kidnapping of Stephanie McMahon. He was supposedly responsible for the whole thing. A lot of people talk about how the corporate ministry didn't make any sense, but you have to really consider Shane McMahon and all of this. People jumped to the higher power reveal without considering how Shane McMahon was defying Vince before the corporate ministry became a thing, and how Shane felt that Vince had lost his nerve and had gone soft. Shane was power hungry, he didn't care about his family, he wanted destruction, and to do this, he brought together the two biggest heel factions in the World Wrestling Federation. 
Yes, the greater power reveal did leave people scratching their heads, but we will get to that soon. I will say this though, Shane McMahon bragging about having money and having great looks while standing beside the Prince of Darkness did seem like a bad fit. Anyway, Triple H would mainly feud with The Rock and The Undertaker would mainly feud with WWF Champion Steve Austin. Undertaker vs Austin was booked for Over the Edge 1999 with Shane McMahon as the special referee and The Undertaker promised to win the WWF Championship at the pay per view. Taker also said that Stone Cold would get sacrificed to the higher power the night after Over the Edge but plans changed here due to Owen Hart's accident at the Over the Edge show. During the opening segment of Raw here, while the corporate ministry were in the ring cutting promos on Vince, The Rock and Stone Cold, four men who were once in the corporation came to the stage, forming yet another faction here as Mick Foley, Test, Ken Shamrock and The Big Show became known as The Union. Foley described the group as a bunch of disgruntled former employees of the corporation and the union decided to hit the ring to have a fight with the corporate ministry. This attack here would shape the remainder of Raw as corporate ministry members were booked into matches with the union throughout the night. Vince McMahon showed up at the arena and he sent his wife and daughter back to their hotel. Vince promised to beat some respect in the Shane and he didn't want the other family members seeing this. Things didn't start off very well as we saw Vince getting thrown around his locker room by Triple H and The Undertaker, but the Shane vs Vince match still went on as planned. It looked like Shane would win this one thanks to Vince getting softened up before the match, but Vince managed to hit a stone cold stunner on Shane and Vince got the win. The audience too gave the reaction that the creative team had been looking for, the crowd popped for Vince hitting the stunner and it seemed like the audience were now accepting that Vince was the lesser evil here. For the main event, Shane McMahon booked Steve Austin vs The Rock in a lumberjack match. The lumberjacks of course would be the corporate ministry. The Rock and Austin didn't even touch each other, straight away a fight broke out between Rock and Austin and the corporate ministry, it all broke down in seconds. Vince McMahon came out and he didn't just bring the union with him, but he brought every other member of the WWF roster to the ring. The brawl ended with Rock and Austin getting thrown off the stage by Triple H and The Undertaker. The storyline would continue full force the next week on Raw, the May 10th 1999 episode. We got to see the corporate ministry arrive at the arena and immediately afterwards we saw Vince lead the Union faction into the arena also. Led by a riot squad, the Union and Vince McMahon went to the ring and Vince called Shane out. Shane and the ministry came out and just as the two factions were about to go to war, Commissioner Shawn Michaels appeared on the screen. Sean said that Shane's match booking the previous week was okay but HBK could do better. Sean took a look at the over the edge match card and noticed Shane was the special referee for the Taker vs Austin WWF Championship match and he decided to add Vince McMahon as a second referee. Sean then made changes to the Raw card. He booked a match between Farouk and Bradshaw with the Union as Lumberjacks. He booked a nightstick on a pole match between Test and the Boss Man. He booked Briscoe and Patterson vs the Mean Street Posse. The losers had to leave the WWF forever. Sean also announced that Ken Shamrock would face China. The Big Show would take on Paul Bearer, an announcement that made Paul Bearer faint. Viscera and Midian would take on hardcore legend Cactus Jack in a handicap match. HBK booked Sable vs Debra in an evening gown match. Of course this was unrelated to the corporate ministry but anyway. The main event match would be a 6 man tag. Undertaker, Triple H and Shane McMahon vs The Rock, Steve Austin and Vince McMahon. Sean said that this main event needed a special referee and he teased on the screen that the referee would need to be a showstopper and an icon. Shane caught on and said Sean was all the way over in San Antonio so it couldn't be him, which led Sean to asking the Riot Squad guys to remove their helmets. Pat Patterson and Jerry Briscoe took off their helmets and Sean asked the third guy to reveal himself. It was Shawn Michaels himself, live and in living colour. HBK would referee the main event match. The first match was the Paul Bearer vs Big Show bout. It didn't last long. Big Show asked The Undertaker to come to the ring after taking out Bearer, but Undertaker brought the cavalry, leading to the Union coming down to help The Big Show. 
The boss man defeated Test in the nightstick on a pole match, and Cactus Jack won his handicap match against Viscera and Midian. The Acolytes said they wouldn't fight each other, Farouk said everyone knows who would win the fight anyway, and this made Bradshaw get a little snobby with his tag partner. A fight broke out between the two, the lumberjack match got underway, but then Midian, Viscera and the boss man came down to stop the match. The bout ended with everyone bailing except Viscera. He was left to take a beating from the Union. The Main Street Posse then took on Briscoe and Patterson. The Stooges got the win when Briscoe locked in a figure four, and this would mean per stipulation set by Shawn Michaels that the Main Street Posse now had to leave the World Wrestling Federation. Triple H escorted China to the ring for her match with Ken Shamrock. Shamrock was attacked by both Triple H and China, and the match didn't get underway. Shamrock had a belly to belly suplex on China, and he left the ring. Shawn Michaels then came to the ring to main event the six man tag main event, and this one was more of a wild brawl than anything else. Still very fun to watch though. Stone Cold got the win for his team when he pinned Shane McMahon. The next episode of Raw also was a lot of fun. Something you'll notice about these 1999 episodes of the Monday Night Show is that each episode had its own little story within a bigger storyline arc, and it was always different every week. Something that we don't seem to have anymore on Monday nights, but anyway. The hits kept coming here as The Rock faced The Undertaker in a casket match, and the main event featured Triple H taking on Steve Austin. At the start of the show, Shane announced that the union may have problems getting to the arena thanks to the corporate ministry doing a little work on their car, and Shane went on to say that Vince McMahon, Steve Austin and The Rock are all on the corporate ministry's hit list this evening, and the corporate ministry will systematically take out each and every one. During the entire broadcast, we would see the corporate ministry backstage planning snake attacks on their victims in order to get the upper hand before the Over the Edge pay-per-view. The corporate ministry first took out Vince McMahon, Triple H, China and The Undertaker were waiting in Vince's closet to launch their attack, and we saw Vince getting stretchered away to receive medical attention. The corporate ministry were then seen backstage and we could hear Undertaker saying that he would take care of Austin. Stone Cold went to the ring for a promo, he was interrupted by the corporate ministry, and just as the faction was about to attack Austin, the Union showed up and a fight broke out. Stone Cold grabbed Paul Bearer, he threw him into the ring, and in order to send a message to The Undertaker, Paul Bearer took a Stone Cold Stunner. The Undertaker's casket match with The Rock was up next. This one really wasn't all that competitive and it was quite short, but it did give us this excellent people's elbow that would get replayed over and over again. During the match, we saw the Union and the Corporate Ministry brawling in the back, and Triple H, Shane and China came down to the ring to give Undertaker an unfair advantage. Triple H hit The Rock with his sledgehammer right on The Rock's kayfabe broken arm. Rock was put in the casket by Triple H and Undertaker gets the win. The casket got locked and Triple H went on a rampage with his sledgehammer, completely destroying the casket with The Rock inside. The Rock then was taken away in an ambulance, so the corporate ministry had taken two of their enemies out. All that was left was Stone Cold Steve Austin. The heels were waiting for Steve Austin to appear backstage so they could jump the Texas Rattlesnake, but the Union showed up and put an end to those plans. The Austin vs Triple H main event then would go ahead as planned, and this was another good Raw main event that's worth your time. Towards the end of the match, we could see The Undertaker's symbol coming down into the ring, and it looked like we were going to see another sacrifice here as The Undertaker's music played in the arena. The corporate ministry though ended up getting cleaned out by the union. The Undertaker tried to handcuff Austin to the symbol, but Austin was able to get the cuffs on The Undertaker, and so The Undertaker himself was raised in the air on his own symbol to end this episode of Raw. The Owen Hart accident at the Over the Edge 1999 pay-per-view is what rightfully overshadows everything else that happened at this show. There's arguments to be made here about how the wrestlers' performances may have been different had the harrowing news of Owen's passing not spread around the locker room, and there's also the fact that this show here should have been cancelled altogether after the accident, but the show went on. The Rock faced Triple H, Austin had a title defence against The Undertaker in the main event, and members of the corporate ministry took on the Union in an 8-man elimination tag match. 
On Sunday Night Heat, Vince McMahon suffered a damaged ankle during an attack by the corporate ministry and so it was possible he wouldn't be able to referee the title match along with Shane, but more on that later. In the 8-man tag, the Acolytes, Viscera and the Boss Man took on Ken Shamrock, The Big Show, Test and Mankind. It wasn't a great match to be honest, it came down to Mankind vs The Boss Man and Mick Foley got the win with the help of Mr. Socko. The Rock was attacked by Triple H in China before their match and the story of The Rock vs Triple H here was all about Rock's exposed broken arm. This wasn't a bad match, they've had better showdowns but it was hard to watch this at the time because of the Owen Hart announcement. So you you can only imagine how difficult it was to go out and perform on this night. The Rock ended up winning via DQ, Triple H punched referee Earl Hebner to give Rock the win and the two men continued to fight after the match. Mick Foley came out to help Rocky when Triple H in China had a numbers advantage and yeah, it was okay. Main event time, Stone Cold vs The Undertaker, Shane McMahon is the special referee and the second referee, Vince McMahon, had seemingly been taken out of the equation earlier in the night. Shane McMahon made his way to the ring first and everyone's surprised there would be a second referee after all. Pat Patterson put on the stripes and it looked like he would be officiating the match alongside Shane. Things got off to a wonderful start when The Undertaker chokeslammed Pat Patterson before Steve Austin even got to the ring. You just knew then that the finish of this match would somehow include the referees. It kinda took away from what was going on in the ring. Still, it was decent. Austin vs Taker at Over the Edge, as weird as that pay per view was, the match wasn't that bad. Jerry Briscoe ran down to try and act as the second referee but he too got taken out. Vince would make a miraculous recovery but Shane stopped him from counting Undertaker's shoulders to the mat. Shane ended up pushing Vince into Austin, Austin fell into a roll up by The Undertaker, Shane performed a fast count and The Undertaker won his third WWF Championship. It's so strange watching this back, The Undertaker winning any championship is always a monumental occasion for WWE fans, but there's hardly any reaction from the audience here, Over the Edge 1999 in itself just shouldn't have happened after the Owen Hart accident and if you want proof, just look at this reaction after the main event. The next week's Raw had a complete format change in order to pay tribute to Owen Hart. It was business as usual on the May 31st 1999 episode however. The show kicked off with the corporate ministry bringing the Undertaker symbol to the ring as Jim Ross told us on commentary that the greater power would be revealed on this very night, the higher power that the Undertaker had been talking about for months. Undertaker confirmed in the ring that the greater power would indeed make an appearance on Raw this evening. Vince McMahon came out and Vince said that The Undertaker screwed Steve Austin at Over the Edge and therefore Vince will screw The Undertaker on this evening. Boy that doesn't sound right. Vince said that The Undertaker would defend the WWF Championship against Stone Cold Steve Austin in the main event live on Raw. Shane said the belt wouldn't be on the line but yeah the match would still happen, Taker vs Austin once again. Vince also announced that he himself would face The Undertaker and because Vince showed he still had big grapefruits, Shane said that if Vince wins the match then The Undertaker would put his belt on the line later in the evening against Austin. If any union member interfered though, Austin wouldn't get a title shot ever again. The Vince vs Undertaker match went down in the middle of Raw then and the audience were very much in Vince's corner here. The referee tried to stop The Undertaker from destroying Vince in the corner but The Undertaker shoved the referee twice causing Mike Chioda to disqualify The Undertaker and award the victory to Vince McMahon. This means the main event would be a WWF title match, Austin vs Undertaker. Before the match, we saw The Undertaker backstage where he said he would not fail his greater power. Main event time and the audience made all the difference here when you compared this match to the Over the Edge 1999 showdown. Not much of this match took place in the ring then, the two men battled outside of the squared circle for most of the match. When the action got moved into the ring, Austin hit a stone cold stunner but Paul Bearer pulled the referee out of the ring. The corporate ministry hit the ring and stone cold got tied up in the ropes. It was time for the greater power to make an appearance. Out he or she walked. Jim Ross and Jerry Lawler speculated that it was Shane. The boy wonder wasn't in the ring after all, so it was a good guess. We wouldn't find out though, the only person who found out who the greater power was, was Stone Cold Steve Austin. When Austin saw Under the Hood, 
he looked extremely, extremely annoyed. Here we go then, the June 7th, 99 episode of Monday Night Raw. It's time to find out who the greater power is. Raw starts off with Vince McMahon coming down to the ring, talking about how he is just as intrigued as everyone else about this greater power thing. Vince talked about who the greater power could be, saying that some people think it's the Commissioner Shawn Michaels, some people think it's a McMahon family member, and some people even think it's Jake the Snake Roberts. Regardless, Vince said he would go one on one with the greater power that evening. Vince said himself he believes the greater power is Shane McMahon and he has no problems fighting Shane. The corporate ministry came out for the next segment and Shane McMahon was absent during the entrance. Taker talked about how he had talked about the higher power for months, how the corporate ministry had laid the groundwork for his arrival, and it was time for the higher power to reveal himself to the world. Someone more evil than The Undertaker, someone with more power than the corporate ministry. It was time for months and months of build up to pay off. When the greater power was in the ring, Shane walked out onto the stage, so all bets were off, it wasn't Shane O'Mac. Shane got in the ring and explained that the greater power is a master thinker. He knows what makes us all tick. He knows how to exploit people for the benefit of the corporate ministry. It was time for the big reveal. Vince McMahon came on the Titantron. He said the game was over and it was time for the greater power to hurry up and show his face. And then it happened. It's me, Austin! Oh, son of a bitch! What? It's me, Austin! It was me all along, Austin! Damn, I cannot believe he's... Vince McMahon. It was Vince McMahon all along. The whole thing for weeks, months even, it was all a ploy. Vince McMahon wanted to teach Steve Austin a lesson, he wanted to get the title from the rattlesnake, and Vince McMahon was proving there was absolutely nothing he wouldn't do to make Austin's life a living hell. Stephanie and Linda McMahon came out. Stephanie asked how could Vince be so cruel to her. Vince said it's just business and love has nothing to do with business. Linda took the microphone and she said yeah then let's talk business. Linda revealed that the four McMahons owned four equal shares in the WWF and that morning Linda had called a meeting with the board directors. Changes were going to be made in WWF offices, including a lighter dress code, profanity would be welcomed and drinking on the job would also become part of daily WWF life. What Linda was getting at here was that she had stepped down as CEO of the WWF but she handpicked her own successor. The new CEO was introduced, taking on Stephanie and Linda's shares within the company, and it was none other than Stone Cold Steve Austin. So in one segment, the greater power angle was pretty much thrown away to basically continue the Austin vs McMahon rivalry. Remember, Undertaker had spoke about the greater power for months, even when he wasn't involved in battles with Austin, but here we are. The Undertaker himself said that this was the lowest point of this evil era for him, saying that the greater power stuff really diluted his evil character, and I firmly agree. With Austin now as the CEO, he would have the ability to book matches that worked against the corporate ministry, and admittedly, Austin's time as CEO had some quite funny moments. The complete WWF ownership though was put up for grabs in a ladder match at the 1999 King of the Ring, Shane and Vince vs Steve Austin and the McMahons won the match. Check this one out too, I thought this one was very entertaining, even considering the talent involved in the bout. The Rock also challenged The Undertaker here for the WWF Championship, and The Undertaker left King of the Ring still the champion, but before Austin lost the ladder match, he had booked himself to get a title shot at the WWF Champion the very next night on Raw. Austin faced The Undertaker, and Austin became the champion once again on Raw. After the match, The Undertaker hit Austin with the title belt, making him bleed. This then led to a first blood match between Undertaker and Austin at fully loaded 1999. If Austin lost, he would never compete for the WWF title again. If Austin won, Austin would never see Vince McMahon again in the WWF. Austin won the match and he gave Vince McMahon a goodbye stone cold stunner to end the show. 
Triple H was named the number one contender around this time, it was now his time to shine, and the evolution of Triple H as the game had begun. The night after Fully Loaded, The Undertaker's unholy alliance with The Big Show started when Show helped Taker fend off an attack from Kane. Later in the broadcast, Taker and Big Show announced that they were going to take over the WWF, and so this left everyone wondering what was going on with the corporate ministry. Triple H had a new attitude, he was going after his first WWF championship, and so his focus was on the main event and not so much being a team player. Vince McMahon had to leave the WWF as per stipulated in the Undertaker vs Austin fully loaded match, so yeah this was pretty much the end of the corporate ministry. Triple H was scheduled to win the WWF title at SummerSlam 1999, however Stone Cold Steve Austin wasn't comfortable dropping the title to him, so instead Mick Foley was added to the match, Foley won the title, and the night after SummerSlam, Triple H defeated Mick Foley to begin his first WWF title run. The Undertaker and Big Show formed this unholy alliance, but that will be covered in a future video. On the August 2nd 1999 edition of Raw then, Shane McMahon pretty much disbanded the corporate ministry and he ended up siding with Triple H in China. The Acolytes would continue on as a tag team and the others split off and done their own thing. The Unholy Alliance tag team featuring The Undertaker and The Big Show is a topic that hasn't been covered very much here on YouTube and I can definitely see why that is. The Undertaker had just had an incredible run with the Ministry of Darkness and while the corporate ministry stuff may have been seen as a bit of a letdown for Undertaker fans, the dead man was still featured in the WWF's biggest angles at the time. After the corporate ministry fizzled out, the WWF creative team would need to come up with something for The Undertaker to do, and similar to how The Undertaker was used to elevate lesser superstars via the Ministry of Darkness, the Phenom was used once again to try and help get talent over, this time it was The Big Show. The team of The Undertaker and The Big Show, known as the Unholy Alliance, didn't garner half as much popularity as the Ministry of Darkness and even today, a lot of wrestling fans like to pretend the tag team just didn't happen, but there is a whole lot of interesting stuff to explore here, from The Undertaker showing the first signs of his American Badass character, to the rocky relationship backstage that The Undertaker had with The Big Show. Let's not waste any more time then as we take a look at The Unholy Alliance. To gain a full understanding then of this tag team, we need to go back to the July 26th 1999 episode of Monday Night Raw, the night after the fully loaded 99 pay per view. At this show, The Undertaker was defeated by Stone Cold Steve Austin in a first blood match, X-Pac had run in during the bout to help Austin secure the win, so The Undertaker was out for revenge the next night on Raw, he wanted to find X-Pac. The Prince of Darkness attacked X-Pac and Road Dogg backstage on Raw, but this wasn't enough, he wanted to give X-Pac a further beating inside the ring. During the beatdown, The Undertaker's brother and X-Pac's tag partner Kane showed up, and the Big Red Machine went after The Prince of Darkness. Keep in mind that The Undertaker had also attacked Kane the previous night at Fully Loaded also. When it looked like Kane was getting the upper hand, The Big Show, who had also defeated Kane at Fully Loaded the night before, came down to the ring and Show helped The Undertaker beat up Kane in the middle of the squared circle. The two men shook hands after they destroyed Kane and just like that, we have a new tag team. Just to get this out of the way also, the tag team were never, not once, referred to as the Unholy Alliance during entrances, they never had a tag team name. The Unholy Alliance name came from JR referring to them as such on commentary. So now Kane was out for revenge. Later that night, a handicap match was booked featuring the Big Red Machine taking on The Undertaker and The Big Show. Show and Undertaker had the upper hand until Kane introduced a steel chair outside the ring while the referee was distracted. The Undertaker ended up getting his hands on the chair though and Kane took a shot to the head, ending the match in a disqualification win for The Big Red Machine. Big Show and Undertaker continued to attack Kane after the bell, leading to the road dog coming down to the ring and also taking a beating from this new intimidating tag team. Later in the evening, The Undertaker and The Big Show had a backstage interview where The Undertaker said, The days of scary music and scary entrances are over. The show, he knows what evil is, and now the whole world will know what evil is. 
the days of Armageddon are upon us. This is quite interesting when you consider that the American Badass character would debut after this unholy alliance angle had finished up, almost as if The Undertaker wanted to move on from his scary dark character and try something else. The Big Show had only been in the WWF for around 5 months at this point, coming from WCW here and getting used to a more organised and structured wrestling company. You'd think that getting paired up with The Undertaker would have made Big Show a happy man, I mean, he was getting an incredible opportunity to team up with one of the all time legends of the World Wrestling Federation. Big Show was excited of course, but he was also dealing with a serious amount of nerves in regards to the Unholy Alliance. The Big Show admits that he was still green, he had a great look of course, but he also admits that he didn't have what it took to be in the main events just yet. And on top of this, the Big Show had walked into a competitive WWF locker room after working in WCW, the land of guaranteed money. A lot of WWF guys saw WCW talent as a threat to their spot on the cards, so the Big Show felt he had to prove himself to the veterans of the locker room, which in turn caused him a great deal of stress. On Steve Austin's Broken Skull sessions on the WWE Network, the Big Show talked about this opportunity and he said, After I fell on my face a few times, The Undertaker took me under his wing to see what kind of guy I was. I was good friends with Brian Adams, Brian Adams and The Undertaker were real close, so I think Brian put in a good word for me. I started working with The Undertaker then and The Undertaker was relentless on me. He would blister me about bumping too much, overselling, not enough aggression, and ring cardio. I remember having matches and knowing I screwed up and instead of going back up the ramp through Gorilla, I would go up the side of the ramp because I knew he was waiting for me. So this gives us great insight into the relationship The Undertaker had with The Big Show and it definitely sounds like tough love. Undertaker wanted to help The Big Show but The Undertaker was going to be a strict coach and The Big Show didn't really know how to deal with the feedback he was getting not only from his tag team partner but from the office as well. I highly recommend checking out the Broken Skull sessions though on the WWE Network. This one here with The Big Show is a real eye opener in regards to how new talent got treated in the WWF locker rooms during the Attitude Era. It seemed like a case of kill or be killed. The August 2nd episode of Raw featured Taker and Show taking on Kane and the Road Dog in a tag team match. New theme music had been put together for this heel tag team, kind of mixing the slow plodding drum loop of the Big Show's theme along with the orchestra work usually found in The Undertaker's music. Some people may have liked the Unholy Alliance theme, but it wasn't for me personally, especially after The Undertaker had been using the excellent Ministry of Darkness music for so long up until this point. You can also tell that The Big Show and The Undertaker really weren't gelling that well during this match. Their timing was off on more than one occasion. The the Undertaker seemingly had to improvise on a few spots, and yeah, it wasn't great to be honest. Taker and Show got the win after Taker hit the Tombstone Piledriver. Later on in the evening, WWF Champion Steve Austin had an interview spot and he was interrupted by The Undertaker and Big Show. Taker told Austin that he wants a WWF title rematch against Austin before he and Show gave Austin a beating in the ring. What you should take away here though is that The Undertaker talked in a very different manner. Gone were the cryptic messages about the dark side and resting in peace all that stuff. Undertaker was now more casual when he threatened Stone Cold Steve Austin. Anyway, Austin said he would give Taker a title match, a no holds barred match was booked for that evening, but the bout never took place. Triple H came to the ring and told The Undertaker that it was Triple H's time, not The Undertaker's, and a brawl broke out between Stone Cold, The Big Show, The Undertaker and Triple H. The ring filled up with more and more superstars wanting to fight each other, and the show went off the air. After The Big Show and The Undertaker had a run in with The Rock on Sunday Night Heat, The People's Champion kicked off the August 9th edition of Raw and The Rock had some choice words for The Big Show. This one was quite memorable, many people will remember The Rock imitating The Big Show during this promo, a timeless classic. Anyway, Undertaker and Big Show came out, they attacked Rocky and this led to Kane, Axe Park and The Road Dog all hitting the ring, making Show and Taker retreat. 
A little later on, The Rock came out and issued a challenge to The Big Show, but he was interrupted by the millennium clock that had been counting down over the past month or so. This of course was the Chris Jericho WWF debut here, just thought I'd throw that in. Rock and Big Show did have a match on this evening, but the match ended when Chris Jericho distracted The Rock, allowing Rock's SummerSlam opponent Billy Gunn to hit the ring and begin an attack on the Great One. The main event then on this episode of Raw was a triple threat match, Triple H vs China vs The Undertaker. The winner would become the number one contender for the WWF Championship, getting their championship match at SummerSlam 99. With Shawn Michaels refereeing the match and Jesse Ventura on commentary, this one turned out to be a fun main event that saw China pin Triple H. China actually became the number one contender here, and the WWF led us to believe that the ninth wonder of the world would main event SummerSlam along with the Texas Rock. Snake. China also beat Triple H in a singles match the following week, but this is a story for another time. Focusing back on The Undertaker in the Big Show, the August 16th episode of Raw featured an in-ring interview segment with the Unholy Alliance. Undertaker again talked in a more casual manner, telling fans to sit down and shut up, and I point this out because this isn't the kind of verbiage The Undertaker would have used previously. It was quite out of character for The Undertaker to address the audience like this, but still let's continue on. The Undertaker announced here that The Big Show and himself were coming for the tag team titles at SummerSlam, and afterwards The Undertaker talked about how he and The Big Show went on a motorbike journey through Death Valley. The Big Show ran out of gas, so he walked the rest of the journey with a motorbike on his back. Taker said this was all done to test The Big Show, and The Big Show passed this test by showing how committed he was by walking for two days in 120 degree heat. Taker said that SummerSlam is now known as Armageddon, and the tag titles were coming to the Unholy Alliance. Even the most die-hard Undertaker fans have to admit here that this one fell kind of flat. We know The Undertaker was trying new stuff here, there was this mix of the evil Undertaker and a more humanised motorbike riding dead man that was putting guys to the test. I get what they were trying to do, but the execution just wasn't that good. Check this one out for yourself though, you'll know what I mean after watching it. Chris Jericho interrupted the promo, most people remember Y2J interrupting The Rock during his debut but no one really talks about Jericho's second week here. Jericho ruffled The Undertaker's feathers, Jericho talked about how The Undertaker and The Big Show were boring and how people would be changing the channel when these two came to the ring, and Chris wrote in his second book that saying these things about a legend like The Undertaker wasn't exactly the smartest move. Ok, moving on to SummerSlam then, the WWF tag titles were on the line when Kane and Axpok defended the belts against The Big Show and The Undertaker. In terms of timing and working together as a team, The Undertaker and Big Show were much better here than what they had been a few weeks ago. They still weren't the road warriors by any stretch of the imagination, but they did look a lot better here, so credit where it's due. Towards the end of the match, The Big Show pinned Axpok with one foot, Axpok kicked out and The Undertaker got seriously annoyed. Taker tagged himself in, he tombstoned Axpoc and he got the pinfall win. After the belts were handed to the Unholy Alliance, The Undertaker screamed at The Big Show for his cocky pin attempt. This is worth noting here, remember that The Big Show was legitimately getting chewed out backstage by The Undertaker and now the same thing was happening on TV screens, art imitating life it seemed. The Big Show and The Undertaker had a tag title defence the next night on Raw against The Acolytes. The Undertaker was not keen on getting involved in this match. He stood in his corner and watched as The Acolytes double teamed The Big Show. It seemed like Undertaker wanted to teach The Big Show a lesson here. The match ended though when Kane and Axe Pop got involved. These two were at the commentary desk during the bout, a brawl broke out between all the men, the bell rung and The Undertaker chewed out The Big Show once again at the entranceway. Later in the evening, Kane and Axe Pack had a match with Viscera and Midian, and the Unholy Alliance were on commentary for the bout. This gives us more examples of The Undertaker changing how he communicated with fans. He was much more cocky, no more telling people about the creatures of the night, things like that. Taker wanted to come across as a badass, and he was doing a good job here. The Acolytes came down to the ring during the match, so we pretty much had the core Ministry of Darkness faction here, either in the ring or surrounding it. 
Viscera and Midian won the match by the way, not much happening here except Taker showing a new side to his character. At SummerSlam or shortly after it, The Undertaker had suffered a groin injury that was going to take him out of action. Viewers who have been watching old Undertaker matches as I post these videos will notice that he had a small yet noticeable limp when walking to the ring, but he kept working. Things must have gotten bad around SummerSlam though, because The Undertaker's ring time would end up getting incredibly limited. I assume he didn't want to take time off right away and instead try to work through the pain, but he just couldn't do it. Smackdown went weekly on August 26, 99. The Unholy Alliance were scheduled to defend their tag titles in a triple threat match that also featured the Acolytes and Kane and Axepock, but The Undertaker didn't work the match. He provided colour commentary as Big Show defended the gold all on his own, further proof here that Undertaker was in no shape to perform. Undertaker said on commentary that Big Show needs to realise that he's a killer, his performance at SummerSlam was an embarrassment and the Big Show needs to prove himself. Taker even slapped the Big Show during the match, saying if he wants the knowledge to be like the Undertaker then he needs to get in the ring and win the match. And this motivation seemed to work, Big Show went on to win the bout. The next week on Raw, The Undertaker was booked into a match with The Rock. If The Rock won, he'd get a WWF title opportunity. Undertaker and The Big Show got in the ring, Undertaker grabbed the mic and the dead man announced that after some thought he would actually not wrestle The Rock but instead he would allow The Big Show to do it. Taker again went on commentary saying that The Rock doesn't deserve to be in the ring with the dead man and so The Big Show worked a false count anywhere match here with the great one himself. The Big Show once again got a pinfall victory here. If The Undertaker wanted The Big Show to prove himself then Big Show was doing a good job of it. Later that evening The Rock and The Big Show would step into the ring once again, this time in a tag match. The Unholy Alliance vs The Rock and Mankind, the WWF tag titles were on the line and while The Undertaker did stand in his team's corner he didn't get tagged in during the entirety of the match. Paul Bear showed The Undertaker something at ringside, something that was in his jacket. We couldn't see what it was, but it caused Undertaker to abandon the match, leaving The Big Show to lose the tag titles to The Rock and Mankind. So why did The Undertaker walk away and what did Paul Bearer just show The Undertaker? Well, we would never find out. The Big Show called out The Undertaker on Smackdown that week. The Big Show didn't immediately get The Undertaker, but instead he got Paul Bearer. Paul Bearer said The Undertaker made The Big Show and The Undertaker could destroy The Big Show. The Big Show though wasn't listening to it, he took out Paul Bearer and this led to The Undertaker now coming to the ring. The dead man whispered something to The Big Show, Big Show looked a little surprised. Then Taker grabbed The Big Show by the throat, telling The Big Man to never disrespect him again. Show left with The Undertaker and we were left scratching our heads. No idea what was going on here, everything was super secretive. What did Undertaker just whisper to The Big Show? Again, we would never find out. The September 6th episode of Raw gave us our first real glimpse of the American badass character. Undertaker was backstage with The Big Show looking very different here. The Undertaker said that he and The Big Show were going to exercise their right to a tag title rematch on Smackdown. They wanted the Rock and Sock connection in a Buried Alive match on Thursday night. The Rock gave us some more comedy gold when he and Mankind accepted the challenge. On Smackdown then, The Undertaker was much more physical than what he had been over the past few weeks but still, he wasn't taking any big bumps or high impact moves. This match still comes recommended though, there were some great spots during the match, like when The Big Show threw Mankind from the stage right into the grave, great stuff here. Triple H attacked The Rock when the fight spilled into the backstage area, Rock was able to come back and take out The Undertaker, but Triple H then showed up at the grave site, the game took out The Big Show and then Triple H himself buried Mankind, meaning The Big Show and Undertaker had won the tag team titles once again. 
On the September 13th edition of Raw, Linda McMahon announced that the WWF Champion Triple H had dug his own grave due to his actions on SmackDown, and a five-way match was booked for Raw with the winner being named the number one contender. The match, featuring Mick Foley, Kane, The Rock, The Big Show and The Undertaker, would be a no disqualification match. The winner would go on to Unforgiven to face the World Wrestling Federation Champion. Taker and Big Show had another backstage interview during this episode of Raw, and The Undertaker was back in his bagger gear also. During the five-way match, Undertaker did get physical again, but he still wasn't taking big bumps. Strangely, Viscera and Midian were at ringside and they helped The Undertaker and Big Show. Jerry Lawler said that Viscera and Midian were learning from The Undertaker the same way The Big Show was, but nothing ended up coming of it, more on that later. The match never got an official winner. A giant brawl broke out that included the entire WWF roster near enough, so we would have to tune into SmackDown to see what was going on. On SmackDown that week, it was announced that a six-pack challenge match would happen at Unforgiven for the WWF Championship, and a five-man Royal Rumble took place to see who would get the first shot at the champion during the six-pack match. The Undertaker came out at number 5, again dressed in his biker gear, and the dead man went straight to the commentary desk. The Undertaker, though, would end up winning this Royal Rumble match. While The Rock and Big Show were busy trying to eliminate each other, Taker just left the commentary desk and got in the ring, and he proceeded to toss both men over the top rope. Big Show got pissed off, but Viscera and Midian were there to back up The Undertaker. The next week on Raw, Big Show and Undertaker dropped their tag titles to Mankind and The Rock. It must have been at this point where The Undertaker realised that he needed to take time off. It seemed like the WWF wanted to get the tag titles from the Unholy Alliance as soon as possible, so Rock and Mankind once again became tag champions. Their match here on Raw was a dark side rules match, a 3 on 2 match that included Midian, Viscera and Big Show on one side, and The Rock and Sock connection on the other. Undertaker once again provided commentary, and yeah, the Unholy Alliance lost the belts here. On SmackDown, Vince McMahon ordered The Undertaker to work a casket match with Triple H. The Undertaker refused, telling Vince that nobody can tell The Undertaker what to do. Vince said that if The Undertaker doesn't compete in the casket match, then he is out of the six-pack challenge at Unforgiven. Taker didn't seem to care. The Phenom said that maybe he won't be around to compete in any matches at all in the future, and he walked away. This was The Undertaker's exit from the WWF for a while, he needed to heal up and take a break. Davey Boy Smith ended up taking Undertaker's spot in the Unforgiven main event. 